The Life of Harry Potter, from Harry Potter. Harry James Potter, born the 31st of July 1980, was an English half-blood wizard, and one of the most famous wizards of modern time. The only child of James and Lily Potter, Harry's birth was overshadowed by a prophecy, naming either himself or Neville Longbottom as the one with the power to vanquish Lord Voldemort, the most powerful and feared dark wizard in the world. After half of the prophecy was reported to Voldemort, courtesy of Severus Snape, Harry was chosen as the target due to his many similarities with the Dark Lord. In turn, this caused the Potter family to go into hiding. Voldemort made his first attempt to circumvent the prophecy when Harry was a year and three months old. During this attempt, he murdered Harry's parents as they tried to protect him, but his unsuccessful attempt to kill Harry led to Voldemort's first downfall. This downfall marked the end of the first wizarding war, and to Harry henceforth being known as the boy who lived, as he was the only known survivor of the killing curse due to being magically protected by his mother's loving sacrifice. In accordance with the terms of the prophecy, this attempt on his life also established him, not Neville, as Voldemort's nemesis. Welcome to the Imagi! Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Also, we just released some brand new merch. If you'd like to show your support for the channel even further while at the same time repping stylish clothing, be sure to check that out as well. The store is linked below. YouTube's been unsubscribing users from channels lately, so if you're a fan of us, please do us a favor and double check to see if you're still subscribed. It only takes a second and it helps us a ton here at Imagi. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Family Lineage the Potters were an old and wealthy pure-blood family, dating back to their founding patriarch, Linfred of Stinchcombe. Linfred was given the nickname Potterer, which was simply changed to Potter over the years. The family took on the simplified nickname as a surname, thus leading to future generations calling themselves Potter. The Potters were also descended from the Peveril family. As such, they are related to Ignatus Peveril, one of the three brothers that created the Deathly Hollows, who passed the Cloak of Invisibility down to his descendants as a family heirloom. The Potters were related to other wizarding families in Britain. James and Lily first met when they attended Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry in 1971. The couple eventually married after graduation in 1978 and served as members of the original Order of the Phoenix at the height of the First Wizarding War. Early Life, 1980 to 1991. Harry James Potter was born on the 31st of July 1980 at Godric's Hollow in the West Country, England. Around this time, a prophecy regarding a boy born at the end of July with the power to defeat Voldemort was stated to wizards. Harry's christening was quiet and quick, with only his mother, father, and Sirius Black in attendance. Harry spent his infancy in hiding with his parents at the Potter Cottage. For Harry's first birthday, Sirius bought him a toy broomstick. Lily's letter to Sirius mentioned that this broomstick had been Harry's favorite present and that he had smashed a horrible vase that had been a gift from Petunia and nearly killed their cat. Lily and James also hosted a very quiet birthday tea. The only ones in attendance were them, Harry, and Batilda Bagshot, who also used to dote on infant Harry. The Potters owned a cat, but what happened to it after Voldemort's attack remains unknown. When it became clear that Voldemort marked the Potters for death in regards to the prophecy, Albus Dumbledore suggested that they use the Fidelius charm to keep them safe. He even offered to be the Potters' secret keeper, but the Potters had already planned to make Sirius their secret keeper instead. On Sirius' advice, they changed this designation to Peter Pettigrew, who they thought would be less suspicious. In a terrible turn of fate, Pettigrew was a Death Eater spy and betrayed the Potter's whereabouts barely a week later. Attack at Godric's Hollow, 1981 On the evening of Halloween in 1981, Lord Voldemort arrived at Godric's Hollow and murdered James and Lily. He murdered James first, who tried to distract the Dark Lord. Unfortunately, he did not have his wand with him and was immediately killed. Voldemort then advanced on Lily, who died trying to protect Harry. Her sacrifice prevented the killing curse from working on Harry, resulting in her love for her child becoming a barrier protecting him. When Voldemort attempted the curse on Harry, it backfired on the caster, and instead of murdering Harry, Voldemort lost all his powers and his physical form was obliterated. Voldemort was saved from death by the five horcruxes he had made up to that point. This later included Harry himself, because a piece of Voldemort's unstable soul latched onto the only living being present. This gave him some of Voldemort's abilities, such as the ability to speak Parseltongue. This event made Harry the only person to have survived the killing curse, thus giving him the title The Boy Who Lived. The failed curse left a lightning bolt scar on his forehead, marking him as Voldemort's equal. 
Rubus Hagrid rescued Harry from the house, partially destroyed by Voldemort's faulty killing curse, and was given specific orders from Albus Dumbledore to take him to his aunt and uncle. As Hagrid left, he was intercepted by Sirius Black, a close friend of the Potters, who pleaded for Hagrid to give the baby to him, as he was the chosen guardian in the event of James and Lily's death. Hagrid refused, saying that he was under orders from Dumbledore to take Harry to his relatives. Sirius reluctantly relented and gave Hagrid his flying motorcycle to take Harry to Privet Drive. Hagrid delivered Harry to Dumbledore late in the evening of November 1st, 1981. Dumbledore left a letter of explanation to the family living in the house, the Dursleys, who did not want to take care of Harry. Life at Privet Drive as the Dursleys were muggles, they could not use magic. They knew about its existence, but refused to associate with witches and wizards. They proudly considered themselves a normal family and despised anything out of the ordinary. They lied to Harry about his parents' death, claiming that they had died in a car crash. They also claimed that the lightning bolt scar on Harry's forehead was from the same crash. Petunia and Vernon Dursley, Harry's new guardians, forbade him from asking questions, particularly those regarding his parents. They resented Harry for his magic, which was sporadic but evident, and strongly discouraged any sort of imagination. They neglected Harry, verbally and emotionally abused him, and inflicted cruel punishments like depriving him of meals and locking him in the cupboard under the stairs whenever something unusual occurred. Their behavior was left unreported to the authorities. In his youth, Harry could make strange things happen without understanding why he could, as no one had told him that he was a wizard. Harry's hardship, however, was highly necessary, as by returning to live with his mother's only living blood relative, the protection that Lily gave Harry would continue. Unbeknownst to Harry, one of his neighbors, Arabella Fig, was a squib, who had been ordered by Albus Dumbledore to keep an eye on Harry, but not to reveal anything of the wizarding world to him. On the 23rd of June, 1991, Dudley's 11th birthday, the Dursleys went to the zoo with Dudley and Pierce. Unfortunately for the Dursleys, they had to take Harry with them, as Miss Fig had broken her leg and there was no one to take Harry, and they refused to leave him alone in their house. At the zoo, Harry spoke with a boa constrictor and unintentionally made the glass of its enclosure disappear. This allowed the snake to slither out of its cage, which scared Dudley into thinking it was after him. Harry was able to communicate in parcel tongue with the freed boa, which thanked Harry briefly, then slithered out of the reptile house calmly. After this incident, the enraged Dursleys sentenced Harry to his cupboard until the beginning of summer holidays. Discovery of Being a Wizard On the week of Harry's birthday, hundreds of letters began arriving at the Dursleys' home, addressed to him from a place called Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. When Uncle Vernon first read the letter, he turned a pale porridge grey out of fear that witches and wizards were trying to contact Harry. Because of this, Vernon tried to destroy the letters in a futile attempt to keep Harry from his destiny. But the letters kept coming in increasingly larger quantities, to the point where they started flying out of the fireplace by the dozens, and as they did, the Dursleys saw no alternative but to flee from them. On July 30th, 1991, in a final desperate move, the Dursleys moved to a shack on a rocky island at the edge of the sea. At midnight on Harry's birthday, Rubus Hagrid appeared in person to find out why Harry had not received his letter. He was infuriated by the Dursleys and explained to Harry, in spite of Vernon's obstinate protests, that he was a wizard. How his parents died, that Dumbledore demanded to take Harry from the ruined house to his hated relatives, this would be Harry's first birthday celebration, and Hagrid gave him a small homemade birthday cake and later a snowy owl. Hagrid took Harry to the Leaky Cauldron, where he learned that he was famous. He met Quirinius Quirrell, the soon-to-be defense against the dark arts teacher at Hogwarts, Hagrid then took Harry to Diagon Alley, where he learned more about his fame in the wizarding world and that his parents had left him a small fortune in a vault at Gringotts Wizarding Bank. Harry bought his first wand from Ollivanders that very day. The wand that chose Harry was made of Hollywood and had a phoenix feather core. It was 11 inches, nice and supple. The phoenix feather at its core came from Dumbledore's phoenix fox. It was crafted by Garrick Ollivander, who had also created a twin wand. This twin wand had chosen Tom Riddle as its master long ago. Hogwarts Years, 1991 to 1997. Harry was guided further to his destiny on the 1st of September 1991 when he was dropped off by the Dursleys at King's Cross Station. With only 10 minutes left and the train's departure at 11 a.m., Harry was panicking when he overheard a red-headed family complaining about the station being packed with muggles, and he noticed how they had an owl with their belongings. Harry watched as the older boys magically passed through the barrier between platforms 9 and 10. Harry nervously interrupted them and was introduced to their youngest son, Ron, who was starting his first year as well. Molly, Ron's mother, kindly gave him instructions on how to board the platform. Harry quickly ran through the barrier, followed by Ron, and arrived on the platform, catching his first sight of the Hogwarts Express. After boarding, the train soon departed, and Ron asked if he could sit with Harry, who agreed. 
Ron asked Harry about his scar, and Harry asked if Ron's whole family were wizards, which they are except for his mother's second cousin who was an accountant. When the trolley witch came by around half past twelve, Harry bought some of the treats from the cart and shared them with Ron. Neville Longbottom soon came by searching for his lost toad Trevor. While Ron was attempting a magic spell to change his rat's scabbers, Hermione Granger interrupted trying to find Trevor. After Ron's spell failed, Hermione introduced herself and upon learning Harry's name, informed him that he was in several books on magical history. Upon arriving, Hagrid gathered all the first years together and they followed a path down to the edge of a great lake. In groups of no more than four, they climbed aboard a little fleet of boats and sailed across the lake to an underground harbor. Helping to remind Neville to take his toad, Hagrid took them up a passageway to the gates of the castle. The new students were greeted at the castle door by Professor Minerva McGonagall, who explained the four houses of Hogwarts, as well as the rules of the House Cup. McGonagall led the first years into the Great Hall where they were greeted by the rest of the students, and more importantly, a shabby wizard's hat on a small stool. Harry was particularly anxious as he did not feel that any of the houses as they were described in the hat's song were right for him. Harry noted that Draco Malfoy, whom Harry had met in Diagon Alley, was instantly placed in Slytherin. When Harry put on the hat, it slipped down past his eyes, and the hat told him that he would do well in Slytherin. And remembered what Hagrid and Ron had told him about Slytherin's reputation for turning out dark wizards, and that Voldemort had been in Slytherin. Thinking of Voldemort, Harry desperately repeated the phrase, not Slytherin. The hat heeded Harry's request and placed Harry in Gryffindor along with Ron and Hermione Granger. The sorting ceremony was followed by the start of term feast. Having previously never been allowed to eat as much as he wanted, Harry was overwhelmed by the sheer variety of foods in front of him. It was during the feast that Harry's scar hurt for the first time. Harry was looking up at the staff table at Professor Quirrell when the hook-nosed teacher Quirrell was talking to looked past Quirrell at Harry, who immediately felt a sharp pain in his scar. After the last morsels melted from the golden plates and goblets, Dumbledore gave a speech, welcoming the new students to the school and the old students back. He added a few warnings about staying away from the Forbidden Forest and avoiding the third floor corridor, before leading the school in singing the school song and sending everyone off to their dormitories. In his first ever potions class, Harry discovered that Professor Snape hated him, mocking him as the school's new celebrity before teaching the class how to brew a boil cure potion. Harry and Ron went to Hagrid's hut for tea where they met Hagrid's large and fierce looking dog, Fang. While they were talking, Harry picked up a clipping from the Daily Prophet that was lying on the table. The article detailed a break-in that occurred on Harry's birthday at Gringotts. The vault that was broken into was number 713, the same vault Hagrid visited with Harry on their trip to Diagon Alley. One of the things that Harry had been looking forward to was learning to fly until he found out that the Gryffindors would be taking flying lessons with the Slytherins. Madame Rolanda Hooch taught the class by starting with basic broom control. After learning the theory, the students were told to hover gently off the ground on Madame Hooch's go-ahead. Terrified of being left behind, Neville panicked and kicked off before anyone else, rising 50 feet in the air before falling off and breaking his wrist. Madame Hooch took Neville to the hospital wing after warning the other students to stay on the ground until she got back. Draco Malfoy nicked Neville's remember-all from the ground and was told to give it to Harry, jeering that he would leave it up a tree unless Harry stopped him and took off on his broom. Harry mounted his broom and kicked off after him. As much to his surprise as everyone else's, he discovered that not only could he fly, but it was something that he did not need to be taught. Bending low on the broom handle, he shot toward Draco, who realized that Harry was a better flyer and threw the remember-all into the air, daring the famous boy to catch it. Harry raced the ball towards the ground, catching it and coming out of his dive a foot from the ground. He toppled lightly on the grass amidst the cheers of the Gryffindors, grinning wildly. His euphoria did not last long, however, as Professor McGonagall quickly arrived on the scene. Having seen the dive, she ordered Harry to follow her. Expecting punishment, Harry was instead introduced to Oliver Wood, whom she pulled out of a charms class. Harry told Ron about everything that happened after he left with McGonagall over dinner that night. Much calmer on the ground, Draco came over to taunt Harry about getting in trouble earlier. Enraged that Harry not only escaped trouble but was instead rewarded, he challenged Harry to a wizard's duel. Harry accepted the challenge. As they left the tower, the trio found Neville, whose wrist had been fixed by Madame Pomfrey, waiting outside, having forgotten the password. Neville decided to go with them and the four arrived at the trophy room, the site of the duel, but Malfoy was nowhere to be found. They speculated that he may have chickened out and were deciding what to do next when they heard the school caretaker, Argus Filch, and his cat, Mrs. Norris, enter the room. Realizing that Draco tricked them and informed Filch of their location, the four kids ran right to the end of the corridor where they found themselves stopped by a locked door, which Hermione opened with the unlocking charm using Harry's wand. 
They hurried inside, thinking themselves out of danger until turning around and coming face to face with a monstrous sight, a giant three-headed dog. Choosing Filch over death, the children ran for it, somehow managing to get back to their dormitory without running into anyone along the way. Over breakfast the next morning, Harry and Ron were discussing what Fluffy could be guarding when the mail arrived. Harry, who had received no mail apart from Hagrid's letter, was intrigued as anyone else by the long, oddly shaped package in the mail, and was even more surprised than the others when he discovered what was inside. A Nimbus 2000, and with a note from Professor McGonagall warning him not to open the package at the table, and that he was to meet Wood that night for Quidditch practice. On Halloween, Professor Flitwick began teaching his students how to perform the levitation charm. Only Hermione succeeded. Offended by her air of superiority, Ron later made a nasty comment that she overheard. The comment was about her lack of friends, causing her to run off and lock herself in the girls' bathroom in tears, and making him and Harry feel guilty. When the two went down to the Halloween feast later, their guilt was forgotten amidst the splendor of the decorations. Partway into the feast, Quirrell arrived to announce that there was a 12-foot mountain troll in the dungeons before fainting where he stood. The prefects led the students back to their dorms, but Harry realized that Hermione did not know about the troll and convinced Ron to help save her since they were responsible. They sneaked off to the girls' bathroom to warn Hermione, locking the troll inside. However, they did not realize their mistake until they heard Hermione's terrified scream emanate from the bathroom. A horrified Harry and Ron ran back into the bathroom to rescue her. After a brief skirmish, during which Harry stuck his wand up the troll's nose, Ron finally knocked the troll out, levitating the troll's own club to smash into its head. Attracted by the troll's yells, the teachers arrived to find Harry, Ron, and Hermione covered in dust and the bathroom in disarray. Professor McGonagall, head of Gryffindor, began scolding the boys for not going straight to their dormitories with the rest of their house, but instead putting themselves in grave danger. Much to Harry and Ron's surprise, Hermione lied to McGonagall and told her that she had gone looking for the troll and that she thought she could handle it and she most likely would be dead if the boys had failed to rescue her. The three bonded over the shared experience and were friends thereafter. As the Quidditch season began, Harry became increasingly nervous. The first match of the season was against Slytherin. Harry was under increasing pressure to show that he was not just a famous name. During a break on the day before the match, Harry noticed that Snape was limping as though his leg were injured, strengthening his suspicions that the potions master was after whatever it was Fluffy was guarding. Harry had little time to dwell on Snape's injury as the first Quidditch match began the next morning. Harry's job as being Gryffindor's seeker was to catch the Golden Snitch. The Snitch is a walnut-sized gold ball that's extremely fast and difficult to see. The entire match rested upon the retrieval of the Snitch. Harry's first attempt to catch the Snitch was foiled when the Slytherin Seeker blatched him. Though the Seeker was penalized, the move succeeded in stopping Harry from getting to the Snitch. Soon after, Harry's broom began bucking uncontrollably as if trying to unseat him. The bucking became even more violent with each passing second until Harry was hanging from the broom with just one hand. As the crowd looked on with horror, some of the professors had their wands at the ready should he fall. Hermione, who had turned her gaze away from Harry and was scanning the stands, noticed that Snape was staring unblinkingly at Harry and muttering non-stop under his breath. Thinking quickly, Hermione took advantage of the fact that everyone's attention was now focused on Harry and the Weasley twins' attempts to rescue him, and she ran around the entire stadium and ended up behind Snape. Muttering a few well-chosen words, Hermione lit Snape's robes on fire with bluebell flames. Suddenly up in the air, the spell on Harry's broomstick was broken and he was once more able to control his broom. The spectators watched in confusion as Harry dove towards the ground only to clasp his hand to his mouth as if he were being violently sick the instant he landed. In actuality, Harry had caught the snitch in his mouth. The capture of the snitch ended the match, resulting in Gryffindor's victory. After the match, Hagrid took the three back to his hut. Ron and Hermione told Harry and Hagrid about what was happening on the other side of the stands, and how Snape was cursing his broomstick. Hagrid, however, did not believe them, asking why Snape would try to kill Harry. Harry told Hagrid about Snape being bitten by the dog on the third floor corridor. Surprised by their knowledge, Hagrid involuntarily revealed that the dog belonged to him, and that what the dog was guarding did not concern them, as it was a secret known only to Albus Dumbledore and a man called Nicholas Flamel. Impressed as they were with the fact that Harry had managed to hold onto a bucking broomstick, Malfoy soon found that the rest of the school no longer found his taunts that Harry was to be replaced amusing, and so reverted to teasing Harry about having to stay at Hogwarts for the holidays. Harry, however, was looking forward to spending Christmas away from the Dursleys, especially in light of the fact that Ron was also staying at Hogwarts, but also because it would give them some time to look up Nicholas Flamel. They were certain that the librarian would be able to find a book on Flamel in an instant, but were worried that it might be suspicious, and thus were forced to look for themselves. On Christmas Day, Harry and Ron awoke to a pile of presents, each at the foot of their beds. 
At the bottom of the pile, he found a package containing an invisibility cloak and an anonymous note telling him that the cloak once belonged to his father, and to use it well. That night, Harry thought on the cloak and decided to try it out. Realizing he could go anywhere, he snuck back to the library and headed straight for the restricted section. Knowing he had to start somewhere, Harry pulled down one of the heavier books and let it fall open on his knee. To his shock and horror, the silence was rent by a blood-curdling scream that issued from the book in front of him. He stuffed the book back in its place and ran for the door, knocking over the lantern that he brought with him in his haste. Ducking under Filch's outstretched arms, Harry ran down the dark corridors, away from the library and away from Filch. Thinking he'd escaped, Harry was scared to hear Filch's voice approaching, and horrified when he realized whom Filch was talking to, Snape. Thinking quickly and panicking slightly, Harry noticed a door to his left. Slipping inside, he found himself in an abandoned classroom. After Filch and Snape passed his hiding place, Harry relaxed and took in more details about the room he was in. In doing so, he noticed something that he missed the first time, an old gilded mirror. Stepping in front of the mirror, Harry nearly cried out in shock. Inside the mirror, he saw a large crowd of people standing behind him. Shocked, Harry turned around to look at the room and saw no one there. Turning back to the mirror and looking more closely, Harry realized that the man and woman in the front looked oddly like him. The man looked just like him from his untidy hair to his glasses, and the woman, Harry saw, had the same eyes that he had. Harry was looking at his family, for the first time in his life. The next night, Harry brought Ron with him to the mirror room. Ron did not see Harry's family in the mirror, but instead saw himself standing alone, tall, holding the house cup, wearing badges indicating that he was head boy and Quidditch captain. The next day, Ron, worried about being caught and about his friend's obsession with the mirror, warned Harry not to return. However, Harry was not to be dissuaded. Going to the room that evening, Harry was ready to stay there all night, staring at the family he lost. However, in his haste, he failed to notice Professor Dumbledore standing by the door until after he removed his cloak. Dumbledore, who had been waiting for Harry, explained that the mirror, which was known as the Mirror of Erised, displayed the deepest, most desperate desire of whoever looked into it. Harry, who had never known his family, saw them standing around him. Before sending Harry back to bed, however, Dumbledore warned him that the mirror was a dangerous object. He told Harry that the mirror was to be moved to a new location and warned Harry not to go looking for it. Despite his promise to Dumbledore, Harry found it difficult to forget the image of his parents. Having realized how much Harry, Ron, and Hermione had worked out about the stone after running into them in the library, Rubus Hagrid told them to meet him in his hut later. When the trio arrived, they noticed that the fire was lit despite the heat of the day. Although he was reluctant to answer their questions, Hermione managed to manipulate him into talking about the various protections used to guard it. Fluffy, the three-headed dog, was Hagrid's, along with enchantments from Professors Sprout, Flitwick, McGonagall, Quirrell, and Snape. Growing uncomfortable in the heat, Harry asked Hagrid to open a window, something Hagrid refused to do as he had a dragon egg in the fire. Unfortunately, Draco Malfoy discovered the dragon and decided to use the knowledge to get revenge by getting them into trouble for possessing an illegal dragon. To save everyone involved, Harry, Ron, and Hermione convinced Hagrid to send Norbert off to Ron's brother, Charlie Weasley, who would take Norbert to a Romanian dragon preserve. Minerva McGonagall, who was very disappointed in them, gave the three detention, which they were to serve along with Malfoy. Argus Filch took them into the Forbidden Forest where Hagrid was waiting for them. Hagrid led them up into the Forbidden Forest and showed them a pool of unicorn blood on the ground. They split up. As they continued, Harry noticed the pools of unicorn blood they were following seemed to be growing larger and larger, as if the animal had been thrashing around. Eventually, they came to a clearing and found it laying on the ground, and very dead. As they watched, a hooded figure emerged from the bushes and began to drink the unicorn's blood. Malfoy screamed and bolted away with Fang, leaving Harry, half-blinded in the pain from his scar, to stumble away from the advancing figure. Harry was saved by Firenze, a Palomino centaur, who allowed Harry to ride on his back out of the forest. Firenze told Harry the properties of unicorn blood. Harry realized that there would only be one person so desperate as to kill a unicorn, Lord Voldemort. While talking to Ron and Hermione after finishing their exams, Harry realized the strange coincidence that had occurred. Hagrid wanted a dragon more than anything else, only to meet a stranger who had one to give him. They ran down to ask Hagrid more about the man who gave him Norbert, only to find out that the stranger never lowered his hood, something of a fashion in the hogshead. Hagrid explained that he could not remember much as the man kept buying him drinks, but he said that he thought they talked about Hogwarts and the kinds of creatures that Hagrid looks after there. Focused on remembering what happened that night, Hagrid accidentally let slip that Fluffy fell asleep when played music. Now convinced that Snape had all the information he needed to get past Fluffy, Harry, Ron, and Hermione decided to go see Professor Dumbledore and tell him their suspicions. 
While walking across the entrance hall, they were stopped by Professor McGonagall and decided to tell her what they had found out. She insisted that no one could steal the stone and told them that Dumbledore was in London for the day. As the trio set off that night to stop Snape, they were stopped themselves by Neville, who believed they were sneaking out without reason again, and he was worried that they would lose Gryffindor even more points. Desperate as they were for time, Hermione paralyzed Neville. When they arrived at the third floor corridor, it was to find Fluffy awake, but a harp by his feet. Remembering what Hagrid told them, Harry began to blow into the wooden flute that Hagrid gave him for Christmas. From the first notes, Fluffy's eyes began to droop and he quickly fell asleep. Jumping through the trap door, they found themselves in Professor Sprout's room, filled with Devil's Snare, which almost smothered them. The next room, Professor Flitwick's, held a bunch of flying keys and some broomsticks. Harry found the correct key, caught it, and unlocked the next door. The next room was Professor McGonagall's and had a large chess board for a game of wizard's chess, which Ron won at the cost of sacrificing himself. Harry and Hermione continued to the next room, leaving an unconscious Ron where they could return for him to find an unconscious troll, Professor Quirrell's room. Lastly, they encountered Professor Snape's room and found seven potions in bottles along with a roll of paper giving clues on which one to drink to continue, a logic puzzle. Hermione solved the puzzle and at Harry's urging drank the potion that allowed her to head back so she could get Ron out, while Harry drank the potion to go forward to the final room. Once inside the room, Harry's attention was drawn to two things, the Mirror of Erised and Quirrell. Quirrell bound Harry before explaining that the mirror was the key to finding the stone. Desperate to distract him from the mirror, Harry questioned Quirrell who revealed that he was serving Lord Voldemort. And although Snape hated Harry, because Snape allegedly loathed his father during their time at school, he never wanted him dead. Unable to locate the stone, Quirrell asked Voldemort for help. Much to Harry's surprise, looking in the mirror, Harry saw his reflection pull the stone out of his pocket and replace it, at which point he felt the real stone drop in his real pocket. He told Quirrell that he saw himself winning the House Cup, but Voldemort, skilled at legitimacy, informed Quirrell that Harry was lying and ordered Quirrell to allow him to speak to the boy. Quirrell unwrapped his turban and turned away from Harry. Sticking out of the back of Quirrell's head, Voldemort demanded that Harry give him the stone. Harry refused, and Quirrell seized him, causing Harry's scar to sear with pain, but contact with Harry's skin burned Quirrell's hands, forcing him to release Harry. He woke in the hospital wing, where Albus Dumbledore reassured him that Quirrell did not succeed in getting the stone, and that the stone had, in fact, been destroyed. Dumbledore then explained the reason why Quirrell could not touch him, and it was because Harry's mother had died to save him, granting him protection against Voldemort. At the end of term feast, after seemingly congratulating Slytherin on winning the House Cup, Dumbledore awarded Ron and Hermione 50 points, Harry 60 points, and Neville 10, which allowed them to win the Cup. Second Year Harry's second year in 1992 started out badly and gradually got worse. Throughout the preceding summer, the Dursleys became so fearful of his newly discovered magical abilities that they locked away all of his school supplies immediately after his return home. They even went so far as to ban him from saying words pertaining to or related to magic in general, as evident to Harry getting reprimanded by Uncle Vernon for saying the word magic at the breakfast table one day. This, however, did not stop Harry from exploiting their paranoia in order to have a quiet time alone. Furthermore, he had no contact with any of his friends nor any news from the wizarding world, and Hedwig took to making noise out of boredom from being padlocked in her cage. On July 31st, Harry's 12th birthday, Harry felt lonely from receiving no letters from his friends. Dudley taunted him, stating, who would want to be friends with you? The Dursleys seemed to have forgotten his birthday too, for they were too busy preparing for a dinner party with a client of Vernon's at work. When he was sent up to his bedroom later that evening for the dinner party, he found a house elf named Dobby waiting on his bed to warn him against returning to Hogwarts, as it meant putting himself in great danger. He tried to tell Dobby that Hogwarts was his home and it was where he belonged. The elf then revealed that he prevented the direct deliverance of the mail from Harry's friends and promised to give the letters back when Harry complied with the warning. This bargain failed as well, so Dobby crashed the dinner party downstairs via a hover charm on Petunia's homemade masterpiece of pudding, which splattered everywhere when the spell was lifted and then disappeared. The mess left behind was thus blamed on Harry, who received an official warning from the Ministry of Magic about using magic outside of school. Taking advantage of this incident and using it as a means to suppress the magical blood in their nephew, the Dursleys locked him in his room with bars on his window to prevent him from returning to Hogwarts as punishment. 
Three nights later, Harry was rescued from his imprisonment by Ron, who was worried about not hearing from him all summer and flew with his older brothers, Fred and George Weasley, in a flying Ford Anglia, belonging to their father, Arthur Weasley, to break the bars off Harry's window and help him retrieve his school things. Hedwig's screeches soon alerted the Dursleys of the getaway, but they were unable to do anything as the car flew off with Harry in tow. They arrived at their destination early the next morning to find a worried sick Molly Weasley waiting in the kitchen to punish her three sons for taking the vehicle without permission. Mr. Weasley came home to discuss the results of his proposed Muggle Protection Act to the Ministry with his family, and was glad to meet Harry once introduced to him, despite his wife berating him for bewitching their car. As a generous measure, the Weasleys welcomed the young wizard into the family fold for the rest of the summer, though this made Ron's younger sister, Ginny Weasley, spend the entire day hiding in Harry's presence. When a Hogwarts acceptance letter for Ginny arrived a week later, the Weasleys set out for Diagon Alley using the flu network eight days afterwards to buy some school supplies. Harry ended up at Borgen and Burke's in the adjacent Nocturne Alley. While inside the shop, he was forced to hide inside a crushing cabinet as Draco Malfoy and his father Lucius Malfoy entered. The shopkeeper, Mr. Borgen, was surprised that Mr. Malfoy was only selling dark and illegally enchanted artifacts and not buying. Mr. Malfoy was selling the items before they could be confiscated by the raids on wizarding households that Mr. Weasley was conducting as a part of the Muggle Protection Act. Borgen expressed pity for the current decline of blood purity. Draco, on the other hand, had interest in a few of the items already on sale, including the Hand of Glory and a cursed opal necklace, and was stopped from approaching Harry's hiding place by his father. As soon as the Malfoys left, Harry was found leaving the shop himself by Rubus Hagrid, who brought him out of Nocturne and into Diagon Alley's Flourish and Blots, where the Weasleys were in line with Hermione and her parents for a book signing for the arrival of the flamboyant but incompetent celebrity author Gilderoy Lockhart, who was recently appointed the new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor at Hogwarts. When Lockhart saw Harry for the first time, he got excited and beckoned him up to the front, allowing the audience to take pictures of them together before giving Harry a set of his books. Harry was too embarrassed by this publicity stunt and gave the books to Ginny since he could afford a set of his own. Draco went over to congratulate him for being unable to avoid making the front page while walking into a bookstore, and then his father moved him aside to have a one-on-one -on -one argument with Mr. Weasley over the latter's obsession with muggles, finding an example of which in Hermione's parents, both muggle dentists, provoking Weasley into lunging at him. Hagrid broke up the fight just in time, but not before the senior Malfoy slipped a diary into Ginny's cauldron of school books. Later, when Harry and Ron tried to get onto Platform 9 and 3 quarters to join Hermione and the rest of the Weasleys, the barrier mysteriously sealed and they hit the wall. They missed the Hogwarts Express as a result and decided to fly the car to Hogwarts, reasoning that they would not be seen due to the invisibility booster that Mr. Weasley installed. However, this booster failed shortly after takeoff and the car was spotted by several muggles as they flew northward alongside the train. Their day-long flight ended with them crashing into the Whomping Willow, Ron's wand was inadvertently broken by the resulting impact as the gigantic tree started pounding the car in anger from being hit. But luckily for them, the battered Anglia broke free from the branches to eject Harry and Ron out of the front seat with their belongings before driving off into the Forbidden Forest. Both boys were found by Professor Snape watching the sorting ceremony from the window. They were taken into his office where they were given separate detentions by Albus Dumbledore and Professor Minerva McGonagall. Ginny Weasley, meanwhile, was sorted into Gryffindor. The next day at breakfast, Ron received a howler from his mother, who told him that he'd be brought home if he broke another rule. The day only got worse when the Gryffindors attended their first defense against the Dark Arts class. Lockhart's teaching was a disaster since the first thing he did was give them a pop quiz on himself and claim the answers would be found in his books. He then let a cage of freshly caught Cornish pixies loose and struggled to round them up, but ended up hiding from them, leaving his young pupils to save the day. As the DADA lessons continued, Harry found himself having to act out scenes from Lockhart's books as he read them in class. Lockhart was in love with fame and kept bothering Harry, who had to help him answer his fan mail while Ron had to polish the school's prizes and trophies. After hours of tedious work, Harry heard a disembodied sinister voice, which Lockhart was unable to hear. Shortly afterwards, before they got to the Halloween feast, Harry heard the voice, which Ron and Hermione could also not hear. He followed it to the second floor where he found the bathroom flooded and Mrs. Norris, Filch's cat, petrified, coupled with a message on the wall. Filch became distraught and threatened Harry as he mistakenly believed Harry to be the culprit. Filch and Snape then tried to get Harry in trouble for this, but Dumbledore said that it was powerful dark magic that no second year could perform. They decided that Sprout's mandrakes would be used once they were mature enough to create a draft capable of reviving Mrs. Norris. 
The occurrence left the students and staff with a sense of dread and worry, as many believed that the writing on the wall was just the beginning. The next day, Hermione wanted to research the Chamber of Secrets, so she talked History of Magic professor Cuthbert Binns into telling the class of its origin. To begin the story, Binns explained that it all started with the founding of Hogwarts itself around 990 AD at the hands of the two greatest wizards and the two greatest witches of the age. Godric Gryffindor, Helga Hufflepuff, Rowena Ravenclaw, and Salazar Slytherin. But Slytherin got into an argument with the other founders about whether Muggleborns should be admitted, and when the rift grew too large between him and Gryffindor, he left the school. According to legend, he built a going-away present to the school in the form of a secret chamber that could only be opened by his true heir. This chamber of secrets allegedly contained a monster that, once released, would purge the school of all Muggleborns. Professor Binns unsuccessfully tried to assure the class that the chamber did not actually exist and that the school had been searched many times in vain. Harry, Ron, and Hermione deduced that the heir was probably Draco Malfoy. To try and prove it, Hermione proposed to use the Polyjuice Potion, which can change one's appearance into somebody else's for an hour. Hermione warned that the potion would take a month to brew, supposing that they gathered all the necessary ingredients, one of which could only be found in Professor Snape's private inventory. During the month that it took the Polyjuice Potion to brew, a Quidditch match between Gryffindor and Slytherin took place. Draco Malfoy had been made Slytherin's new seeker on the merit of his father's generous contribution to the team, a set of Nimbus 2001 brooms. During the match, one of the bludgers took after Harry and completely focused on him. Malfoy lost no time in making fun of the maneuvers Harry had to perform in order to avoid the bludger. Since bludgers were supposed to attack each and every player, the crowd soon realized that this bludger had been tampered with. Harry still managed to catch the snitch and Gryffindor won. He caught it right out from under Malfoy's nose, who was more focused on taunting Harry than looking for the snitch. However, the bludger broke his arm and Lockhart, in an attempt to fix it, removed all the bones instead. Madame Pomfrey gave Harry a potion called Skelligrow to counter this, and he was forced to stay in the hospital wing overnight. During that night, Dobby visited Harry, and revealed that it was he who made the bludger chase him, and was also responsible for the barrier on platform 9 and 3 quarters not letting him in. This was a misguided attempt to protect Harry from the monster inside the chamber. Dobby proceeded to ask Harry to leave the school, something he refused to do. He also revealed that the Chamber of Secrets had been opened before and immediately punished himself, as he was not supposed to reveal anything. After Dobby disappeared, Dumbledore, McGonagall, and Madame Pomfrey entered with Colin Creevy, who had apparently been petrified. He was found with a camera containing film that had been burnt to the melting point. Harry signed up for a dueling club, which was, to Harry's great displeasure, taught by his two least favorite teachers, Lockhart and Snape. The event was scheduled to take place in the Great Hall. During the club's first meeting, Lockhart demonstrated an ineptitude. He was successfully disarmed by Snape and floundered throughout the entire practice duel. Also, during a practice battle in the first meeting, Draco Malfoy conjured a snake to attack Harry. Lockhart tried to banish it, but all he managed to do was let it loose on the students. Harry saw that the snake was rapidly approaching on a muggle-born student and Hufflepuff named Justin Finch Fletchley, who had introduced himself to Harry before the incident, and instinctively told it to stop, which, to Harry's great surprise, it did. The other students were less than ecstatic about this development, however. All they saw was Harry speaking Parseltongue, a language of snakes, and became afraid. Since they could not understand it, it seemed to them that he was egging the snake on. Due to this, Harry became the number one suspect among students for being the heir of Slytherin. Hermione even told him that since Salazar Slytherin lived so long ago, he might actually be. His ability to speak Parseltongue also caused the student body to spread vicious rumors about him. They claimed that he could not be a decent wizard since he could speak to snakes. Seconds after leaving a conversation with Hagrid, Harry ran into a petrified Justin Fitch Fletchley and a black, smoking, nearly headless Nick. For the first time, Harry was taken to Dumbledore's office, and there he witnessed Fox, Dumbledore's phoenix, bursting into ashes and being reborn. Harry, Ron, and Hermione all signed up to remain at the school during Christmas, since Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle had done so as well. This gave them the perfect opportunity to use their Polyjuice Potion. When Christmas arrived, they drugged Crabbe and Goyle via chocolate cakes, took their hairs, and assumed their forms. Hermione tried to use a hair that she thought belonged to Millicent Bulstrode, but it was actually her cat's, and Hermione was transformed into a hybrid. Hermione was forced to spend a few weeks in the hospital wing. Posing as Crabbe and Goyle, Harry and Ron interrogated an unsuspecting Malfoy and discovered that Draco was not the heir of Slytherin. 
They also heard that the last time the chamber was opened, a muggle-born girl died, and whoever was responsible was expelled. During the interrogation, Malfoy also mentioned Dumbledore and Harry. He relayed his negative opinion of them, stating that Dumbledore was the worst thing to happen to Hogwarts. Weeks later, Ron and Harry overheard Argus Filch complaining about his workload and leaving. They arrive at Myrtle Warren's bathroom to find it flooded. A sulking ghost, Myrtle explained that she had flooded it because someone threw a diary at her. Harry picked it up, and it turned out to have belonged to a T.M. Riddle, and appeared to be completely blank. Ron remembered from his detention that Riddle had won an award for special service to the school 50 years prior. Hermione deduced that since this coincided with the last time the chamber was opened, Tom Riddle may have received his prize for catching whoever was responsible for the attacks back then. Even though all attempts to extract information from the diary failed, Harry felt a strange compulsion to keep it. Later, Harry realized that even though the ink was spilled all over the diary, it was not stained at all. He tried writing in the diary, and to his surprise, the diary, or rather T.M. Riddle, began to write back. Riddle explained that he was the one who caught the person who opened the Chamber of Secrets the last time, and that he could show Harry what had happened. Harry agreed and got sucked into a recording of Riddle's memory. Harry witnessed the school's previous headmaster, Armando Dippet, informing Riddle that the school would be closed, and Riddle, apprehensive of this, caught Rubus Hagrid fiddling with a large spider in a box. Riddle reported Hagrid to Dippet. During the memory, Harry also learned that Riddle was an orphan that did not want to go back to the orphanage, and his full name was Tom Marvolo Riddle. Having seen this, Harry wondered whether Hagrid was the one who opened the chamber 50 years before, and whether he was responsible this time. This was exactly what Riddle wanted. Harry, Ron, and Hermione decided not to ask Hagrid about it, hoping that the attacks had stopped. However, odd things kept happening. Harry returned to his dormitory one day to find it a mess. Ron deduced that someone was looking for something, and Harry eventually noticed that Tom Riddle's diary was gone. This greatly befuddled them, seeing as only a Gryffindor could know the password to enter the dormitory. The next day, the scheduled Quidditch match between Gryffindor and Hufflepuff was cancelled due to yet another attack, and Harry heard the voice again. This time, Minerva McGonagall called for Harry and Ron personally and led them to the hospital wing. There, they saw Hermione petrified. She was found near the library with a Ravenclaw prefect, inexplicably holding a small circular mirror. This removed Harry as suspect in the eyes of many of the students as they knew he would never harm Hermione. Some students even offered him an apology, such as Ernie McMillan. Harry and Ron decided that they now must talk to Hagrid. They managed to do it by using Harry's invisibility cloak. When they reach Hagrid's cabin, Harry and Ron managed to hide, just before Dumbledore and Minister for Magic Cornelius Fudge arrived at the scene. Fudge announced that Hagrid, who to the best of his knowledge opened the Chamber of Secrets the last time, would be sent to the wizard prison Azkaban as a precaution. They were shortly joined by Lucius Malfoy, who declared that he and other Hogwarts governors unanimously voted to suspend Dumbledore, despite the obvious logic that this would only worsen the situation. Both Hagrid and Dumbledore gave last words, but Hagrid covertly suggested to Harry and Ron that if they want the truth, then they should follow the spiders, and Dumbledore said that he would only truly have left the school when none there remained loyal to him. He also stressed that if anyone at Hogwarts needed help, it would always be available. Harry and Ron decided to follow the spiders as per Hagrid's advice. Walking along the trails of the spiders, which were strangely all fleeing Hogwarts, they went into the Forbidden Forest. Even though Ron was deeply arachnophobic, the fact that Hermione had been petrified and that they may be able to help through this investigation gave him the willpower to go along anyway. There, they encountered the Ford Anglia, who had apparently taken to driving through the forest like some kind of wild animal. They eventually meet Aragog, a giant spider who had been the monster that Hagrid had been caught setting on other students 50 years ago. Aragog explained that Hagrid was innocent, but rather than letting Harry and Ron go, he decided to serve them as dinner for his children. Mr. Weasley's Anglia came blasting through the layers of spiders, however, and assisted in the boys' escape. After this, Harry and Ron felt that they had reached dead ends everywhere, until one last possible hope occurred to them. Aragog said that the monster's last victim died in a bathroom, and it occurred to Harry that Myrtle Warren might have been that victim. Of course, with the school under such security, it would be almost impossible to sneak in the girl's bathroom near where the first attack occurred. Later that same day, Harry and Ron managed to trick Lockhart, who was leading them to their next class, into letting them go by stroking his ego. Just as they patted themselves on the back, they were caught by Professor McGonagall, and Harry had to make up an excuse. They were going to see Hermione in the hospital wing, where visitors were now barred. They now had to go along to make their story appear convincing, but rather than simply hanging around Hermione's petrified form, this time Harry noticed a piece of paper tightly clutched in her hand. This piece of paper revealed what Hermione had found out before she was attacked. 
She discovered, based on strong circumstantial evidence, that the monster in the Chamber of Secrets was a basilisk, a giant slithering serpent capable of feeding on human and animal aura to cause petrification and death to anyone near it via direct eye contact. But none of the victims died because they did not look directly in its gaze. Colin Creevy saw it through his camera, Justin Finch Fletchley saw it through nearly headless Nick, who was already dead, Mrs. Norris saw its reflection in the waters from the flooded bathroom, and Hermione used a mirror to look around corners after figuring things out. There was also a note about how spiders feared the basilisk, which explained them fleeing Hogwarts, and the rooster's call being potentially fatal to it, which explained Hagrid's roosters having been mysteriously killed during the year. This summed up the year's events. On the note was also scribbled a single word, pipes, which meant that the serpent moved around through the plumbing. Having solved the mystery, Harry and Ron decide to go to the staff room and report to the teachers. When they got there, they overheard the teachers talking about another attack that had occurred. Harry and Ron decided to hide to hear more details, and learning that Ginny had been kidnapped and the heir of Slytherin had left another message under the previous one. Harry and Ron also heard that Hogwarts would be closing the following day. The teachers then forced Lockhart to deal with the monster, as he had been claiming that he could handle whatever was responsible for the attacks irritating the rest of the staff to no end. Looking very crestfallen, he left for his room. That night, Harry and Ron felt utterly useless and helpless, until it occurred to Harry that if the serpent used the plumbing to get around and the last time the chamber was opened, a girl died, then the chamber entrance must be in the bathroom that Myrtle Warren haunted. They went to his room, only to find him frantically packing, having decided to run away. When questioned on why such a talented wizard as himself was leaving, Lockhart admitted that he was a fraud and that he put memory charms in the people who really did the things that he claimed to have done in the books. He then attempted to put a memory charm on Harry and Ron as well. They managed to disarm him and under wand threats, they took him to Myrtle Warren's bathroom. Harry then asked Moaning Myrtle about her death, which she happily explained. She stated that the last thing she saw was a pair of enormous eyes by one of the sinks. This sink incidentally had a tap that never worked. Harry came to the conclusion that the tap can only be opened by the use of parcel tongue. He found a snake carved on the tap and then opened the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets. Harry, Ron, and Lockhart slid down a large pipe and found themselves in maze-like tunnels far under the school. Down there, they encountered a snake skin left by the basilisk. Just then, Lockhart feigned fainting and stole Ron's wand, victoriously proclaiming that he would erase their memories and tell everyone that they lost their sanity at the sight of Ginny's mangled body, Lockhart attempted a spell. Ron's broken wand caused the charm to backfire, erasing Lockhart's memory and causing a portion of the ceiling to cave in. This trapped Harry in the direction of the chamber and Ron in the direction of the castle. Ron had no choice but to stay behind and clear a path through the rocks while Harry continued in search of Ginny. Harry then encountered a wall with stone snakes on it and opened it by speaking parcel tongue, then entered the chamber itself. Inside, he found Ginny lying on the ground, pale and cold. He dropped his wand and ran to her, trying to get a response, but to no avail. He then saw Tom Riddle smiling at him and holding Harry's wand. Riddle explained his presence in the present by revealing that he was a memory, which had been preserved in this diary for 50 years. He then explained what had happened. Riddle had opened the Chamber of Secrets 50 years ago and planned to purge the school of Muggleborns and Halfbloods. However, when he learned that the school was going to close down due to the attacks and that Dumbledore, the then Transfiguration teacher, was keeping a closer and closer watch on him, he had no choice but to cease the attacks and frame Hagrid. Not wanting to waste all the years he had spent on figuring out where the chamber was and how to get to it, he left behind a diary containing the memory of his 16-year-old self in hopes that it would, one day, fall into the hands of an unsuspecting victim who would help finish the work for him. Ginny had been writing in the diary all year. Riddle had written back sympathetically, and Ginny grew to confess her hopes, fears, and feelings to him. She essentially poured some of her soul into him, which was exactly what he wanted. He gradually grew more powerful and eventually managed to pour some of his soul back into her, possessing her and using her body to open the chamber and launch the new series of attacks. However, Ginny eventually became suspicious of the diary and decided to get rid of it by flushing it down the toilet in Myrtle Warren's bathroom. This is when Harry found it. When Ginny saw Harry with the diary on Valentine's Day, she panicked and worried that Riddle had told all of her secrets to Harry, so she stole it back from Harry's dormitory. Riddle then asked how Harry managed to defeat the dark wizard Lord Voldemort as a mere baby. 
Harry asks Riddle why he cares, as Voldemort existed after his time. He then wrote his name in the air with Harry's wand, Tom Marvolo Riddle. Riddle then waved his wand, and the letters rearranged themselves into I am Lord Voldemort. Needless to say, this meant that Riddle grew up to become Lord Voldemort. Riddle then revealed that he was, in fact, a half-blood, and his mother had named him Tom after his muggle father, and Marvolo after his wizard grandfather, a descendant of Salazar Slytherin. He scrambled his filthy muggle father's name to create a new one, which he knew that people would fear when he became the most powerful wizard in the world. Harry retorted that he must be mistaken, because the greatest wizard in the world, as everyone knew, was not Voldemort, but Dumbledore. In this display of loyalty, he summons Fox the Phoenix to him, who also brought with him the Sorting Hat, both assets that Riddle deems useless. Riddle then summoned the Basilisk and commanded it to kill Harry. However, Fox was not as defenseless as one might initially think and pecked out the Basilisk's eyes, thus preventing its gaze from killing. The Basilisk could still smell Harry, however, and remained very dangerous. In desperation, Harry put on the Sorting Hat, wishing against hope for help. Instead of an answer, Harry had a heavy sword with a hilt embedded with rubies fall on his head from inside the hat. After several missed strikes from the blinded basilisk, Harry plunged the sword into the roof of its mouth, killing it. However, one of its poisonous fangs sank into his arm, injecting a deadly poison. While Riddle gloated over his win, Fox proceeded to cry on the wound, and Harry was instantly cured. Harry then stabbed the diary three times with the basilisk fang to rid himself of Riddle, unknowingly destroying one of Voldemort's horcruxes in the process. Ginny immediately stirred and woke up, quite distraught. Harry and Ginny traveled back through the chamber to find Ron and Lockhart, who had no idea of who or where he was. They returned to the castle to find Dumbledore, McGonagall, Arthur, and Molly Weasley, who were delighted to see them alive. Harry worried that Ginny would be blamed for being the person behind the attacks, but to his great relief, Dumbledore rightly deduced that Voldemort was the culprit. Dumbledore then gave Ron Hagrid's release paper for him to mail and then spoke with Harry alone. Harry expressed his concern that he belonged in Slytherin. Dumbledore revealed that Voldemort transferred some of his powers to Harry when he gave him his scar, explaining his ability to speak Parseltongue, and told Harry that it is our choices rather than our abilities that reveal who we truly are. Lucius Malfoy barged into Dumbledore's office, outraged that Dumbledore had returned to the school after being dismissed. Dumbledore calmly responded that the governors had asked him to return once they heard that Arthur Weasley's daughter was attacked. They had apparently been blackmailed by Lucius to vote for Dumbledore's dismissal in the first place on pain of Lucius cursing their families. Dobby followed Lucius into the room, thus showing that his masters were the Malfoys. Dumbledore and Malfoy had a calm and venomous exchange, respectively, during which Dumbledore and Harry, with the help of Dobby's unspoken hints, essentially exposed Lucius sneaking Riddle's diary, one of his illegal artifacts, into Ginny's school things during the fight with Arthur at Flourish and Blotts. This was supposed to frame Ginny for the attacks, with heavy implications on the Muggle Protection Act that Arthur Weasley had been suggesting. Malfoy dared Dumbledore to prove his accusation, and while the headmaster had insufficient evidence to do that, he cautioned Malfoy against orchestrating further plots. Knowing that a master could release his house elf by giving him some clothes, Harry tricked Malfoy into freeing Dobby by giving Malfoy one of his own socks which he promptly threw away and was caught by Dobby. After discovering Harry's trick, Malfoy attempted to kill Harry, only to be stopped by Dobby. Dobby thanked Harry dearly for freeing him and left. At the ending feast, Dumbledore announced his school treat of cancelling all final exams, much to Hermione's dismay, and that Lockhart would not return to Hogwarts. Third Year Harry's third year in 1993 started out almost as bad as the year prior and gradually got depressing. On Harry's 13th birthday, the Dursleys were busy preparing for a visit from Aunt Marge. When his Hogsmeade permission form was delivered, Harry was worried of the trouble he'd probably go through in order to persuade his aunt or uncle to sign it. They agreed to do so the next morning, but only if he behaved during Marge's visit. However, Marge began insulting the memory of Harry's mother at the dinner table three days later, describing her as a bad egg who ran off with a scoundrel, and left the Dursleys and Harry as the result in front of them. Harry lost his temper to this, inadvertently making Marge's wine glass explode. The insults transitioned to his father on the final day of her visit, making him very upset to such extent that he ended up losing all control of his magic powers and accidentally inflated her with the inflating charm. Vernon ordered his nephew to put Marge back the way she was, but Harry said no and instead packed up his school things and left the house. He fled out of fear of being expelled from Hogwarts by the Ministry of Magic for using underage magic outside of school, something he had already been warned about. Later that night, Harry was picked up off the curb of Magnolia Crescent by the triple-decker wizard transport, the Night Bus. During the ride to the Leaky Cauldron, the bus's conductor, Stan Shunpike, gave him a copy of the Daily Prophet, with its front page being about the Ministry's continuing struggle to recapture Sirius Black. 
a convicted Voldemort supporter who recently escaped from the wizard prison Azkaban, the first person to have ever done so, after spending 12 years there for the mass murder of 13 people with a single blasting curse. They arrived at their destination to find a relieved-looking Cornelius Fudge waiting at the restaurant door to welcome Harry in for a meeting. To Harry's relief, though, the Minister for Magic took no action against him since accidental uses of magic did not count as a violation to the decree for the reasonable restriction of underage sorcery. As a generous measure, Fudge booked the young wizard a room in the Leaky Cauldron Inn for the rest of the summer, though this made something about Fudge's tone spike Harry's suspicion. Harry found Ron and Hermione looking all over for him at Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlor four days afterwards while the Weasleys were booking a room at the inn. When they got into platform nine and three quarters, Mr. Weasley moved Harry aside to tell him not to go looking for Black. According to Mr. Weasley, when Voldemort met his downfall, Black lost everything he hoped to gain. But to that day, he remained a faithful servant to the Dark Lord's cause. The Ministry feared that the killer's motive was to use Harry to return his master to full strength, as evident to the report from Fudge's inspection of Azkaban saying that Black was repeatedly muttering, he's at Hogwarts, in his sleep. This shook Harry a little to the realization that Fudge let him go because he was relieved to see Harry all right after running away, but Harry claimed that he would never look for someone who wanted him killed. He, Ron, and Hermione found only one empty compartment on the Hogwarts Express. Harry told his friends of what he heard about Black until the train stopped about halfway to Hogwarts, letting one of the Dementors, a gliding wraith capable of feeding on human happiness to cause depression and madness to anyone near it via mental energy draining, used as the Azkaban guards aboard to determine if Black himself was hiding. Only Harry and Ginny were the most affected by the creature since he had the worst past involving the night Voldemort killed his parents and she had the worst experience of being under the control of the sentient memory within Voldemort's old school diary the year before, and were about to fall to its fatal kiss when Lupin cast a Patronus charm which drove it away. Harry fainted to the sound of his mother screaming, but recovered when Lupin gave him a piece of chocolate to feel better and sent a letter ahead to Professor Minerva McGonagall saying he was ill. Lessons started the next day. Harry, Ron, and Hermione headed to the North Tower for their first divination lesson. They met Sybil Trelawney, who predicted future events using tea leaves. Harry saw a black dog in his teacup, which Trelawney identified as the Grim, the Omen of Death. This worried Harry as he remembered the black dog he saw when he ran away. While in Transfiguration, Professor Minerva McGonagall assured Harry that Trelawney had predicted the deaths of a number of students, none of whom had died. While Lupin's lessons were enjoyable, Hagrid soon became dreary. In their Care of Magical Creatures lesson, Hagrid taught them about hippogriffs. Although initially nervous, Harry successfully approached and rode a grey hippogriff named Buckbeak. During the first lesson, Draco Malfoy deliberately provoked Buckbeak into attacking him. This, in turn, caused Draco to tell his father of the provoked attack. Lucius Malfoy then filed a complaint against Hagrid, more specifically, the Committee for the Disposal of Dangerous Creatures. Meanwhile, tensions grew between Hermione and Ron over Crookshanks' continuing habit of trying to harm scabbers. Harry learned that Black had been sighted near Hogwarts. In defense against the dark arts, Lupin taught the third years about Bogart, shapeshifters that took the shape of the person's worst fear. The class then took on the Bogart, forcing it to assume a shape they find amusing. When it came to Harry's turn, he was sure the Bogart would turn into a Dementor, but Lupin jumped in and repelled the Bogart for him. Faced by a Lupin, the Bogart took the shape of a bright glowing orb. Harry was disappointed that Lupin did not let him fight the Bogart, thinking that Lupin felt he was not up to the task. In October, the third years were also visiting Hogsmeade on Halloween, and only Harry was not allowed because his uncle did not sign his permission form. Harry spent the day in Lupin's office drinking tea. Lupin told him that he did not let Harry face the Bogart because he did not want the Bogart to become Lord Voldemort. Shortly afterwards, Snape appeared with a mysterious potion for Lupin. Lupin claimed to simply have an illness and that he was aided by this potion. A few hours later, Ron and Hermione returned from Hogsmeade. They reached the portrait of the fat lady and saw that it was slashed and that the fat lady was gone. Using his animagus form, Sirius was able to enter the castle undetected. He made his way unseen all the way up to the entrance of Gryffindor Tower and changed back to his true form. However, the fat lady would not let him in without the password. Frustrated, Black slashed her portrait and fled. During the last weekend before the holidays, while the eligible students visited Hogsmeade, Harry was yet again not able to go. To bring some Christmas cheer to Harry, Fred and George revealed that they knew secret passages in and out of Hogwarts. They gave Harry the Marauder's Map as a Christmas present and instructed him on how to use it. It showed Hogwarts secret passages, corridors, classrooms, offices, common rooms, etc., as well as every person's location within the castle and on the grounds. Harry used the Marauder's Map to sneak into Hogsmeade. He then met Ron and Hermione in Honeydukes, where they were discussing what kind of sweets to get Harry. 
they visited the Three Broomsticks, a pub run by Madame Rosmerda. When Cornelius Fudge, Minerva McGonagall, Phileas Flitwick, and Rubus Hagrid arrived, Harry hid underneath their table to avoid being seen. While sneaking back to the school, he overheard a disturbing conversation that had a severe impact on his mental state. Sirius Black was his parents' best friend, and was his godfather and legal guardian. Black was the Potter's secret keeper, and he allegedly divulged the Potter's secret whereabouts to Lord Voldemort and murdered their friend Peter Pettigrew, as well as 12 muggle bystanders. Not long after that meeting, several Dementors approached Harry during a Quidditch match, causing him to faint and fall off his broomstick. Albus Dumbledore stopped Harry's fall, but his Nimbus 2000 flew into the Whomping Willow and was destroyed, much to Harry's dismay. At Christmas, Harry received a new, superb Firebolt broomstick, although Hermione suspected Black was the anonymous donor. She reported it to McGonagall, who confiscated the broom for testing. Harry and Ron were furious with Hermione, and they stopped speaking to her. Later, Harry started his lessons with Lupin. Lupin told Harry that the spell to drive off the mentors is called the Patronus Charm. Lupin then instructed him in how to cast one, and lets him practice on a boggart. Harry failed to produce a Patronus at first. This, however, was to be expected. The Patronus Charm was well beyond OWL standard. During his first lesson, Harry learned that Lupin was a friend of his father James during their days at Hogwarts, and he knew Sirius Black as well. By February, Harry had become quite good at producing a Patronus after a few lessons, but did not master it entirely. At the end of a lesson, Lupin explained the concept of a Dementor's kiss and revealed that it would be Black's punishment, as an article in the Daily Prophet confirmed that the Ministry gave the Dementors permission to use the kiss on Black when they find him. Weeks later, after Harry completed his divination exam, Professor Trelawney entered a trance and predicted that the Dark Lord's servant would return to him that night. Harry and Ron finally made peace with Hermione, but the trio soon learned that Buckbeak would be executed. Cornelius Fudge, Albus Dumbledore, and the Executioner were making their way to Hagrid's hut, but Harry, Ron, and Hermione made their way out the back door. As they were walking up the path, they thought they heard Buckbeak executed, when all of a sudden Scabbers bit Ron, and Ron chased him to the Whomping Willow. A large dog attacked Ron and dragged him and Scabbers into a hole at the tree's base. Harry and Hermione followed, finding a secret tunnel leading to the Shrieking Shack. Inside, Harry confronted Sirius Black, who, as an unregistered and therefore illegal animagus, could transform into an animal at will. Lupin, who spotted the group on the Marauder's map, suddenly burst in and embraced his old friend Black. Harry, Ron, and Hermione refused to believe that Pettigrew was alive, pointing out that he was murdered by Black. Black denied this, and Lupin convinced him to tell Harry the truth of what happened. Lupin told the story about his time at Hogwarts. He had been bitten as a child, and Dumbledore took precautions for his stay at Hogwarts, having the Shrieking Shack and the passage leading to it built to provide Lupin with a safe place to transform. The Whomping Willow was planted on the entrance to the tunnel to prevent anyone from running into the transformed Lupin. The rumors that the Hogsmeade residents started about the shack, about being haunted by violent ghosts, were allowed to spread to keep people from guessing that it was actually a werewolf making those sounds. Just then, Snape arrived using Harry's invisibility cloak, which he'd left at the foot of the Whomping Willow. Snape was knocked out by Harry, Ron, and Hermione, who all tried to disarm him at the same time. Harry was skeptical until Black and Lupin forced Pettigrew back into his human form. This came as a huge shock to Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Black then explained he discovered that Pettigrew was still alive and escaped Azkaban to seek revenge, as well as to make sure that Pettigrew could not harm Harry. Harry stopped Black and Lupin from murdering Pettigrew, believing that his father would not have wanted his two best friends to become killers. As the group headed back to the castle, the full moon rose, causing Lupin to turn into a werewolf. During the ensuing commotion, Pettigrew escaped, while Sirius turned into his dog form to protect the others from Lupin. Lupin fled, leaving Black badly injured. As Dementors moved in to attack Black, Harry saw a mysterious figure in the distance cast a powerful stag-shaped Patronus, scattering the vicious creatures. Harry became convinced that it was his father, or at least his father's spirit, who produced the Patronus. Black was then captured and taken to the castle where the Dementors intended to suck out his soul. Hermione revealed to Harry that she was entrusted with a time-traveling device called a Time-Turner, which was how she was able to attend so many classes. Prompted by Dumbledore, she and Harry traveled three hours into the past, watching themselves go through the night's previous events. They freed Buckbeak and returned to the Whomping Willow. As the Dementors were about to attack the other Harry and Sirius, Harry realized that the mysterious figure he saw earlier was actually himself. He cast the powerful Patronus and repelled the Dementors. Harry and Hermione freed Black, who escaped on Buckbeak, as they rushed back to where they were before. As they saw Dumbledore exiting the hospital wing, they completed their journey. After Sirius was revealed to have once again escaped, Severus Snape burst into the hospital wing and blamed Harry, but left when he was unable to convince anyone without any proof. 
Fudge said he would remove the Dementors because they tried to perform their kiss on Harry. Draco Malfoy was furious that Buckbeak escaped while Hagrid was ecstatic. Professor Lupin resigned after Snape accidentally revealed that he was a werewolf. The previous night, Harry visited Lupin in his office, during which the map was returned to him. On the train back, Harry received a letter from Sirius telling him that he had sent the Firebolt, and included a letter giving Harry permission to visit Hogsmeade. Fourth Year Harry woke up from a nightmare at the Dursleys' house on Privet Drive. He experienced a vivid dream regarding muggle Frank Bryce. Bryce had learned of Voldemort's plans to reward Pettigrew for his help in capturing Bertha Jorkins. Frank was eventually discovered by Voldemort's snake, Nagini. The Dark Lord, unhappy that the Elderly Gardener was spying on him, cast the Killing Curse, ending the Elderly Gardener's life. After which, Harry woke up with his scar hurting and considered writing to his friends and even Dumbledore, but eventually decided to write a letter to Sirius. On the 25th of August, 1994, Harry, the Weasley family besides Mrs. Weasley and Hermione Granger attended the Quidditch World Cup. They were all able to see the match between the Irish and Bulgarian national teams up close because Harry, the Weasley, and Hermione had seats in the top box. The night after the match, while the Irish team's supporters were still celebrating, a group of black cloaked hooded figures proceeded to pillage and destroy everything in sight. On Mr. Weasley's orders, Harry fled into the woods near the campsite along with Ron, Hermione, Fred, George, and Ginny. While in a clearing in the woods, Harry, Ron, and Hermione heard someone shout the incantation Moore's Mortar, casting the Dark Mark, a green skull with a snake protruding from its mouth like a tongue into the sky. Although Harry did not immediately recognize its significance, he soon learned that the Dark Mark had evil implications. Then, Barty Crouch Sr., Amos Diggory, and other Ministry of Magic employees apparated into the clearing and began to question Harry, Ron, and Hermione about the Dark Mark. After Harry mentioned that he had heard another voice conjure the Dark Mark, the Ministry employees searched the area. Weeks later, at the Hogwarts start of term feast, Professor Dumbledore announced that Hogwarts would host the Triwizard Tournament, a recently revived inter-school competition in which the Beaubaton Academy of Magic and the Durmstrang Institute would also participate. New rules stated that only students 17 and older could compete for safety reasons. Also, during the start of term feast, Dumbledore introduced Mad-Eye Moody, an ex-Auror, as the newly appointed Defense Against the Dark Arts professor. This news was greeted with a mixture of responses as Moody was known to be a great auror, a little crazy, and to have a magical eye, earning him the nickname Mad-Eye Moody. During the first lesson with Moody on a Thursday, he reveals that he will only be staying for the year and decides to show the fourth-year Gryffindors the unforgivable curses. Despite some fear among the students, Moody shows the entire class the three curses using spiders as his test subjects, the Imperious Curse, Cruciatus Curse, and Killing Curse. He also reveals that the use of these spells gained the user a one-way ticket to Azkaban. Around Halloween, the students from Bobaton's Academy of Magic and Durmstrang Institute arrive at the school. The arrival of the famous international Quidditch star Victor Crumb caused a lot of excitement, particularly among the girls. Victor Crumb, Fleur de la Cour, and Cedric Diggory were all chosen to represent their respective schools in the tournament. However, Harry was mysteriously chosen as a fourth competitor. This came as a shock for all those present due to the fact that he was underage and that he had never entered his name into the Goblet of Fire during the selection process. Many people, even Ron and his fellow Gryffindors, did not believe Harry's story. They thought this to be nothing but another attempt to gain even more fame and eternal glory. This caused extreme tension between the two friends and they did not speak again for a long time. A few days after his name unexpectedly came out of the goblet, Harry attended the wand weighing ceremony where his wand was inspected. After the champions and judges go through a long photo shoot, Harry goes to dinner and then returns to Gryffindor Tower. Once in the tower, Ron tells him that he has an owl. The letter is from Sirius, telling Harry that he will contact him on the 22nd of November at 1 o'clock a.m. Harry must be alone at the fireplace in the Gryffindor common room at that time. There, the notorious Daily Prophet reporter Rita Skeeter asked him many leading questions, took everything he said out of context, and wrote a ludicrous article about him and Hermione. A piece that claimed that Hermione was Harry's girlfriend and that she was toying him around by seeking the affections of Victor Crumb, who himself was very much smitten with her. Harry faced even more turmoil during this time as a majority of the student body was making everyday life difficult for him. Hufflepuff believed that Harry was stealing the spotlight from their house and Draco Malfoy was doing everything in his power to make Harry even more miserable. He accomplished this by making and mass producing Potter Stinks badges, which many students proceeded to wear around. Malfoy had also taken to commenting and reading aloud Rita Skeeter's articles every chance he got, making Harry very uncomfortable. In the first task, each champion needed to get past a dragon in order to collect a golden egg. 
Harry received help from Hagrid, who showed the dragons to him and Madame Maxime. Realizing that every champion but Cedric had found out about the dragons, Harry told Cedric about the first task. He did this as a way of leveling the playing field. The newly appointed Defense Against the Dark Arts professor, Alistair Moody, witnessed Harry telling Cedric, but did not report him. Instead, he advised Harry to play to his strengths, hinting that he should use his flying ability to get the golden egg. Four different dragons were chosen for each of the champions to face. Fleur ended up with the common Welsh green, Cedric with the Swedish short snout, Victor Crumb with the Chinese fireball, and Harry faced the Hungarian horntail, the most dangerous of the four. Harry used a summoning charm to bring him his firebolt, then dodged the Hungarian horntail to get the golden egg. Harry proved to be the fastest when it came to capturing his egg, which earned him a compliment from Professor McGonagall. Seeing how dangerous the task was, Ron decided that Harry did not put his own name in the goblet. He also came to the conclusion that someone was trying to kill Harry, and made amends with him after months of not speaking. Harry was so relieved that Ron had come to his senses that he instantly forgave him. Between the first and second tasks, the Yule Ball, a Triwizard Tournament tradition, took place on Christmas. Ron, dismayed to discover that Victor Crumb had asked Hermione to go with him, called her out for consorting with the enemy, though he and Hermione acted as if they had not fought the following day. Harry asked out his longtime crush, Cho Chang, but was disappointed to learn that she had already accepted an invitation from Cedric Diggory. Harry and Ron ended up attending with Parvati and Padma Patilla, respectively. Harry watched Cho with Cedric, and Ron was overcome with jealousy for Victor Crumb, who danced with Hermione. To prepare for the second task, Harry was told that he had to open the egg that he had won from the dragon, but every time he did, it let out a horrifying screech. His rescue from that particular problem came when Cedric Diggory paid him back with the information that he would figure it out if he were to mull things over in the hot water with the egg. Harry reluctantly followed this advice and decided to take a bath in the prefect's bathroom. Harry learned that the second task was going to be going into the Black Lake and rescuing the thing that they would miss most from the merpeople. Harry's new problem was how he was going to survive underwater for an hour. He got his answer in the form of Gillyweed from Dobby, who had come to work at Hogwarts. The second task took place on the 24th of February. Harry was able to save Ron, but when he reached them, he was shocked to find Hermione, Cho, and Gabrielle Delacour, Fleur's sister, there as well. After all other hostages were rescued, Harry hung around and saved Gabrielle as well as Ron. The judges were then informed that Harry reached the hostages first. He was outside the hour that had been allotted, although doing so earned him extra points for moral fiber. After Harry was mysteriously entered in the Triwizard Tournament, Sirius hid in a cave near Hogsmeade, where Harry, Ron, and Hermione occasionally visited him, and provided mostly moral support to Harry during this time. Sirius warned him about Igor Karkaroff, the Durmstrang headmaster, telling Harry that Karkaroff used to be a Death Eater and that he gave up a considerable number of names in exchange for his freedom. Harry told Sirius about seeing the name Bartimaeus Crouch appear on the Marauder's map when he was working on the second clue. Sirius admitted that it was fishy, but told Harry to focus on the task at hand and leave the mystery surrounding Crouch to the others. A month before the final task, the champions were shown the beginnings of the challenge. They were told the third and final task was going into a maze filled with obstacles to find the Triwizard Cup. At that moment, Barty Crouch Sr. appeared in the forest disoriented and asking for Dumbledore. He disappeared when Harry went to fetch him. During a divination lesson, Harry passed out and had a vision of Voldemort being informed of someone's death, and him torturing Wormtail for failing to prevent someone from escaping. Harry awoke with his scar badly hurting and pretended he needed to go to the hospital wing. He actually went to see Dumbledore. Once in the headmaster's office, Harry overheard an argument between Dumbledore, Moody, and Cornelius Fudge regarding the Barty Crouch situation. Moody interrupted the debate to explain that Harry had arrived. Harry was left alone in the office after Dumbledore, Fudge, and Moody left to examine the school grounds. While looking around, Harry noticed Dumbledore's pensive. Through curiosity, Harry peered in and ended up looking into three of Dumbledore's memories. From the days immediately after the end of the First Wizarding War, the first was the trial of Igor Karkaroff. The second memory showed the trial of Ludo Bagman. The third was the trial of the Lestranges. Crouch sentenced them all to a lifetime in Azkaban. Weeks later, to prepare for their final task, Harry, Ron, and Hermione used vacant classrooms to practice spells and jinxes. Harry successfully navigated the maze with the aid of the four-point spell. Along the way, he heard Fleur scream. Harry rescued Cedric, who had been attacked by a bewitched Crumb. Harry managed to stun Crumb and send out a signal for Crumb to be rescued before he and Cedric moved on. Harry managed to pass a Sphinx. During this final event, Harry saved Cedric from an Acromantula, and Cedric, being grateful, offered Harry the cup. 
Both Hogwarts champions then showed supreme sportsmanship and cooperation despite the tension brought on by the maze. They agreed to touch the Triwizard Cup simultaneously as it would be a Hogwarts victory either way, which would result in a tie for first place. Harry and Cedric were unaware that the cup was actually a portkey and were transported to a graveyard in Little Hangleton. This graveyard was the Riddle family's final resting place, where Lord Voldemort was waiting. Just as Harry and Cedric are trying to figure out what happened, someone appears and Harry's scar begins hurting again. Acting on Voldemort's orders, his servant Wormtail murdered Cedric with the killing curse. Harry saw a flash of green light and heard Cedric's body hit the graveyard's ground with a thud. Harry is then dragged to a large marble tombstone with the name Tom Riddle engraved upon it, where he's bound. From there, he was forced to witness a ritual in which Pettigrew used some of Harry's blood to restore Voldemort's body. Death Eaters were summoned to the cemetery. After his Death Eaters arrived, Voldemort spends time criticizing them for failing to seek out during these last 13 years. He then rewards Wormtail for aiding with his rebirth by creating a new silver hand for him. The Dark Lord identifies more Death Eaters and reveals that his servant who is at Hogwarts has ensured that Harry would win the tournament and be brought to the graveyard. Voldemort then frees the injured and weakened Harry and orders him to face him in a duel, wishing to prove who among the two is stronger in front of his minions now that there's no one around to protect Harry. When Harry refused to observe the formalities of a wizard's duel, Voldemort used the Imperious Curse to force Harry to bow to him. Voldemort then tortured him by subjecting him to the Cruciatus Curse and attempted to use the Imperious Curse again, but Harry was able to resist it the second time. When it didn't work, he tried to murder Harry using the Killing Curse. Harry fired back with the Disarming Charm. The nature of their wand's mystical connection caused their magical streams to interlock, which created an effect called Priori Incantatum, Reverse Spell Effect. Harry was then momentarily shielded by the echoes of Lord Voldemort's previous victims, including Harry's parents and Cedric. This bought Harry some time to grab Cedric's body and the port key. Chaos erupted when Harry returned to Hogwarts with Cedric's dead body in tow. It was uncovered that Barty Crouch Jr., who had willingly taken the Dark Mark as a young man, was throughout the school disguised as defense against the Dark Arts teacher Alistair Moody. Crouch, disguised as Moody, managed to usher Harry away from the panicking crowd to interrogate him about Voldemort's return. He wanted to murder Harry, but Dumbledore and several other members of the Hogwarts staff arrived to stop him. Under the influence of Veritaserum, Crouch confessed everything. In a terrible turn of fate, Crouch's soul was extracted by the Dementor's kiss from the Dementor that accompanied Cornelius Fudge. Fudge felt that his personal safety was in jeopardy, hence why he brought the Dementor. As a result, Crouch Jr. could not give testimony and the Ministry of Magic began to dispute Harry and Dumbledore's insistence that Voldemort had returned. The Minister refused to believe Harry's account of Voldemort's return, even when he was supported by Albus Dumbledore. This was due to Fudge not wanting the peace and tranquility they had worked so hard for to be destabilized by this announcement. The Ministry publicly denied the Dark Lord's return and branded Harry and Dumbledore either liars or nutters in the press. Voldemort and his Death Eaters took advantage of this to operate in secret, while Dumbledore called for a reconstitution of the Order of the Phoenix. Fifth Year Witnessing Cedric Diggory's murder was very difficult for Harry, and it was not helpful that he was forced back to Number 4 Privet Drive during school holidays. He suffered constant nightmares and flashbacks. Also, his friends, Ron Weasley and Hermione Granger, seemed to block him from information, and he was blocked entirely from the wizarding world except for the Daily Prophet that said Harry was wrong. To make matters worse than they already were, on the 2nd of August, somebody sent Dementors to attack Harry in the Muggle town of Little Whinging, in an attempt to neutralize him. He was forced to perform a Patronus charm in order to save Dudley and himself. Subsequently, Harry was formally accused of performing underage magic in the presence of a muggle and was expelled. But thanks to Albus Dumbledore's intervention, this was changed to a disciplinary hearing in front of the entire wizen gamut and the Ministry of Magic. He was threatened with expulsion from Hogwarts, but was exonerated with help from Dumbledore, who had a witness and legal loopholes to help him. In retaliation against Dumbledore, Minister for Magic Cornelius Fudge appointed Dolores Umbridge, his senior undersecretary, as the new Hogwarts defense against the Dark Arts teacher so that she could spy on the school. She was later appointed Hogwarts High Inquisitor, empowered to arbitrarily change and impose school rules whenever she chose. She made numerous rules that the students were expected to follow, and if they did not, harsh punishments would be enacted. Umbridge proved to be sadistic and cruel, with a personality that resembled poison honey. Harry hated her on sight, and she had a deep dislike for him as well. Every time Harry spoke out of turn or even mentioned Voldemort, Umbridge threw him into detention. The detentions he had with her were torturous, forcing him to write with a black quill. The black quill was her own invention, and it made him write with his own blood, scribing the message, I must not tell lies onto the 
the back of his hand. Harry had to endure numerous sessions with the quill, so many that the words were now permanently carved into his hand. These detentions, however, did not sway him from his opinions or make him subservient to Umbridge. They had the opposite effect and strengthened his resolve to stand by his statements of Voldemort's return. Also, once Umbridge found out that he gave the quibbler an exclusive interview, she banned the magazine, which caused the whole student body to take an interest in it. Because Fudge was racked with paranoia and stubbornly believed that Dumbledore was training an army to overthrow him, Umbridge had the defense against the dark arts class reduced to reading textbooks. This proved an ineffective teaching method and did nothing to prepare students for what was to come. Hermione proposed the idea that Harry teach the students as he has previous experience defending himself against the dark arts and various monsters. The trio held a meeting at the Hogshead to discuss with other students the possibility of Harry giving them defense lessons. Harry is stunned at how many there are. After some initial skepticism, the students started to list Harry's achievements. The rescue of the Philosopher's Stone from a disembodied Voldemort, the slaying of Slytherin's Basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets with the Sword of Gryffindor, the ability to produce a corporeal Patronus, and the winning of the Triwizard Tournament. Giving in to Hermione's persistent urgings, Harry secretly trained a group of students in practical defensive magic. In an attempt to make light of the Ministry's fears, the group called themselves Dumbledore's Army, or the DA. Feeling highly anxious and frustrated most of the time, Harry found out that the DA was now his chief source of happiness and the thing to which he looked forward throughout his school day. This happiness was felt by most members, as all of them, particularly Neville and the Creevy brothers, gained a lot of skills under Harry's tutelage. Harry taught the group many different spells, ranking from the simplistic disarming charm to the highly advanced Patronus. The class progressed at a fair rate, practicing the impediment jinx, reductor curse, stunning spell, and various other hexes and jinxes before temporarily breaking Waking up for Christmas break. Cho Chang also became a member. During the meetings, whenever Harry was near, she'd become so flustered that she had difficulty casting spells correctly. Before the Christmas holidays, she and Harry were discussing how she had never been able to pull off the stunning spell before when the room generated mistletoe. The room did so due to sensing the tension that was present. Under the mistletoe, the two kissed for the first time. This moment was confusing to Harry, as Cho, clearly still suffering from her ex-boyfriend's death, had been crying during their kiss. Cho's crying during the kiss also caused concern in Harry. Harry later informed Hermione and Ron of his disastrous first kiss and Hermione comforted him, saying that it was not his kissing that made Cho cry. However, Harry took on some much more pressing worries later that night. Lord Voldemort, wanting a secret weapon against him, had heard of the prophecy hidden in the Ministry's Department of Mysteries concerning the both of them. Voldemort had been obsessing over the door to the Hall of Prophecy for the past few months and had been inadvertently allowing Harry to read his thoughts through legitimacy. The link between Harry and Voldemort's minds had been growing stronger for quite a while. A result of this growing connection comes to pass after Harry fell asleep in the boy's dormitory on the night of his kiss with Cho. Harry witnessed Nagini attack Arthur Weasley in his dream and felt almost as if he had been the snake. Harry woke the other boys and proceeded to vomit. Professor McGonagall was immediately alerted to the problem. Realizing what could happen if the Link grew more powerful, Dumbledore commissioned Snape to train Harry in occlumency in an effort to prevent further problems. Critically injured, Arthur was sent to St. Mungo's Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. Harry, Ron, Ginny, Fred, and George took a port key to Grimald Place. When they arrive at headquarters, they were greeted by Sirius, who ordered them to stay put and wait for news. Mrs. Weasley stated that Arthur survived the attack and was grateful towards Harry. Even though Arthur survived, he was required to take a blood replenishing potion at regular intervals. Weeks later, lessons were given once a week under the guise of remedial potions, much to Harry's discomfort. Unfortunately, Harry was extremely curious about the door he keeps seeing within his dreams. Under Snape's tutelage, Harry repeatedly had his mind broken into in order to train him. Snape also ordered Harry to close his mind every night as practice. Unfortunately, due to the mutual animosity between teacher and student, Snape was unkind and discouraging in his methods despite his own mastery of the skill. While Harry did not take Snape's lessons too seriously and neglected to practice, Coupled with Harry being emotionally open at all times, the lessons did not progress much, with only rare instances where Harry was able to resist, if only briefly. During a lesson in occlumency, Snape stepped out of the room and Harry's curiosity got the best of him. He looked into the pensive which contained Snape's memories, and to his dismay, Harry found images of his father bullying Snape and of his mother rushing to his defense. Snape himself discovered Harry's spying. Snape refused to give him any more occlumency lessons, something that Harry was not particularly concerned about and he did not inform anyone of. Uncovering the source behind Snape's hatred for James left Harry seeing his father in a slightly different light. He also found comfort in the fact that at least his mother appeared to be a person of strong morals, while wondering why she ever agreed to marry James in the first place. 
As the second term progressed, Umbridge is appointed headmistress and imposes even tighter control. Fred and George Weasley rebelled against the new authority at the school. On one occasion, the twins released enchanted fireworks throughout the castle. In a final act of defiance, the twins summoned their brooms, openly mocked Umbridge's authority, struck the squad members with a variety of jinxes, and escaped the school to pursue a career in their joke shop with the money Harry lent them. Later on, the fifth years began the sessions on advice of what they would need to do to prepare for the careers they would pursue after graduation. During Harry's career advice session with Professor McGonagall, he told her that he wanted to be an Auror. During this admission, they were rudely interrupted several times by Umbridge. She remarked against Harry's ambition of becoming an Auror. She stated that applicants could not have a criminal record and those constant interruptions angered McGonagall. The meeting ended with McGonagall supporting him and having a screaming argument with Umbridge. During the final Quidditch match of the year, in which Harry did not play as Umbridge had him banned for life, Hagrid, who had returned to the school months into the term and very badly beaten, decided to show Harry and Hermione why he was so badly injured. This caused them to miss much of Gryffindor's Quidditch match. Hagrid also relayed to the trio where he had been during those months that he was away. He, along with Madame Max Maxime were given a mission to the giant colony in order to persuade them to join Dumbledore and his cause. This mission proved to be a failure to the Order as the giants chose to align with the Death Eaters due to their shared love of violence and killing. Hagrid had dragged a giant back with him from his mission over the summer. It transpired that the giant named Grop was Hagrid's half-brother on his mother's side, and that Hagrid had been attempting to civilize the giant, but with few results. He made Harry and Hermione promise that they'd look after Grop should Hagrid be forced to leave the school for any reason. Hagrid was attacked and left the school during OWL examinations, and thus Harry never had to go down to Grop in the forest. Eventually, late in the OWL examinations on the 18th of June, while taking his History of Magic exam, Harry dozed off. He received a vision of Voldemort torturing Sirius and ordering him to get the prophecy. Harry was prepared to go to the Ministry immediately, but Hermione advised him to check Grimald Place first to see if Sirius was still there. Harry used the flu network in Umbridge's office to peer into Grimald Place, where creatures stated that Sirius was gone. Unfortunately, Umbridge caught Harry and his friends in the act. Umbridge asked Snape to extract information from Harry through use of Veritas Serum, but Snape claimed to have none left in his stock. Umbridge then resorted to the Cruciatus Curse, revealing that it was she who set the Dementors loose on Harry. Hermione managed to save him by luring Umbridge into the Forbidden Forest. Once in the forest, Umbridge attempted to harm Harry and Hermione, but was dragged off by centaurs for calling them filthy half-breeds, beasts, and creatures of near-human intelligence. Harry and Hermione escaped when Grop stumbled into the centaur camp looking for Hagrid. The trio, along with DA members Ginny Weasley, Neville Longbottom, and Luna Love, Good, who had assisted in Harry's attempt to contact Grimald Place, used Thestrals to fly to London. After reaching the Department of Mysteries, Harry led them all through various rooms in a search for Sirius without finding him. The group became doubtful until they came across a room filled with crystal balls, later to be known as Prophecies. One of the Prophecies had Harry's name on it, and he picked it up, much to the displeasure of Hermione. Upon picking up the Prophecy, Death Eaters appeared, revealing that it was all a ruse to bring him there. Harry then attempts to buy time by fully mocking Voldemort in front of his Death Eaters, which infuriates Bellatrix, yet Lucius stops her from hurting Potter, not for defense, but so they can continue to protect the prophecy. Just then, on Harry's signal, the six DA members all used the Reductor Curse to smash the shelves of prophecies, distracting the Death Eaters so they could flee. Chaos ensued. Harry's group was chased through various rooms, when in the Death Chamber, all but Harry and Neville were incapacitated in the fighting. Then, reinforcements from the Order of the Phoenix, alerted by Snape, arrived to help in the battle. In the ensuing fight, Sirius Black was murdered by a killing curse from his cousin Bellatrix Lestrange, and fell through a mysterious stone arch. Harry pursued Bellatrix using the Cruciatus Curse, but he was unable to kill her. Voldemort appeared, angered by the failures of his Death Eaters. For the second time, he attempted to fatally curse Harry, who was too transfixed to even defend himself, but Dumbledore's sudden arrival saved him. Voldemort then fully possessed Harry, hoping that Dumbledore would sacrifice Harry Harry in order to kill Voldemort. However, Voldemort was forced to leave Harry's body when Harry's grief for Sirius became too overwhelming to bear, as Voldemort did not understand the concept of love. Voldemort then grabbed Bellatrix and disapparated, but not before the minister and ministry employees saw him and finally accepted that he was back. Back at Hogwarts, Harry appeared in Dumbledore's office and tried to get out after Phineas Nigelus Black mentioned Sirius only to find the door locked. Dumbledore explained to Harry the real reason why Voldemort had tried to kill him as an infant. A prophecy stated that he was destined to defeat the Dark Lord, for he had powers Voldemort did not. The ability to love, something that the Department of Mysteries was trying to research in a locked room. 
As a result of the battle, the Ministry of Magic realized that Lord Voldemort had indeed returned, and Harry and Dumbledore were vindicated along with Sirius, though he didn't live long enough to enjoy his freedom, but was honored as a hero by the Ministry. Serious steps were taken following this change in policy, such as the dismissal of Umbridge. However, this was not a sea of change, as the Ministry still distrusted Dumbledore. Sixth Year in the wake of the Battle of the Department of Mysteries, Harry was sent home to Four Privet Drive for the summer holidays. There, he obsessed and brooded over his godfather's death, where he hardly left his room and refused meals. As the battle had taken place at one point in the famed Hall of Prophecy, many in the wizarding community, including the Daily Prophet, began to speculate about the relationship between Harry and that place, leading to accidentally correct reports calling Harry the Chosen One, the one destined to defeat Lord Voldemort once and for all. Early in his summer, Dumbledore requested that Harry join him in some unknown adventure. He arrived to pick Harry up at Four Privet Drive on a Friday late in the evening. However, they could not depart immediately because there was a piece of business to attend to, Sirius's will. Much to his rage, Harry inherited his godfather Sirius Black's estate. This included 12 Grimald Place, the Black Family Vault, and the Black's irritating and half-crazed house elf, Creature. Harry still retained animosity towards Creature after his involvement in Sirius's death a few months previous. He also gave Dumbledore permission to continue to use Grimald Place as Order Headquarters. Afterwards, they were off, and Dumbledore apparated Harry to the small village of Budley Babberton, where Harry was introduced to Horace Slughorn. In their time together, Harry and Slughorn discussed some of the professor's old students and the improved security at Hogwarts. When Harry and Dumbledore made to leave, Slughorn agreed to return to the school if he got a raise and a larger office. Following their visit, Dumbledore dropped Harry off at the burrow, but not before informing Harry that he was to be given special lessons by Dumbledore himself. Later in the summer, Harry learned that he had achieved seven OWLs. He also received a surprise when he was made captain of the Gryffindor Quidditch team, which put him on equal standing with prefects. Having learned of Professor Slughorn's propensity for hand-picking favorites, Harry experienced this firsthand. He and many others were invited to join Horace Slughorn's Slug Club during the ride to Hogwarts aboard the Hogwarts Express. Harry did not enjoy the experience and made to leave as soon as he possibly could. Instead of returning to his previous compartment, Harry made to eavesdrop upon Draco Malfoy. Malfoy's participation in meetings weeks earlier had led Harry to believe that he had taken the dark mark. What he heard did nothing to dispel his suspicions. Harry arrived late to the welcoming feast due to an encounter with Malfoy in which Malfoy realized he was eavesdropping under his invisibility cloak. Malfoy froze him with the full body bind curse and stomped on his nose, breaking it and leaving him there unconscious. He was soon found by Nymphadora Tonks, who healed his nose and escorted him to the castle. At the feast, Harry was shocked to learn that Severus Snape had been promoted to defense against the dark arts professor. While this disappointed Harry greatly, his career as an aura reopened, as Professor Slughorn would accept his exceeds expectations score in potions. As Harry had not bothered to buy a textbook, Slughorn allowed Harry to borrow an old one from the supply cabinet. When Harry examined it, he found that it had once belonged to a student who identified only as the Half-Blood Prince. The book contained copious handwritten notes that helped Harry excel in potions for once. In fact, his skills won him a prize from Slughorn, a small vial of Felix Felicius, also known as Liquid Luck. As promised, Dumbledore began the private series of lessons with Harry concerning Lord Voldemort. In the first lesson, Dumbledore showed Harry the first of a number of memories he had collected concerning Voldemort's past in his pensive. These lessons regarding Riddle's past were in order to learn his secrets and weaknesses. Dumbledore promised Harry that this information would help him survive and would prove crucial to the eventual defeat of Lord Voldemort. During this lesson, Harry also learned who Tom Riddle's parents were and how they came to be married. He also learned what kind of mindset the Gaunt family possessed, and how Marvolo and Mor Orphan believed strongly in blood supremacy, something Voldemort's mother, Merope, did not share. Afterwards, as the new Gryffindor Quidditch captain held trials to select the team for the annual Quidditch Cup, due to Harry's popularity, it proves to be extremely taxing and difficult, with even first years, Ravenclaws, and Hufflepuffs showing up for the trials. The first test he administered was a basic flying test, something that proved to be a good idea as it became clear to Harry that most of the students present were not adept flyers. After an arduous morning of tantrums, foolishness, and many complaints, Harry picked out the members of the team. The three chasers, one of whom was Ginny Weasley, who outflew all their competition and scored 17 goals, two beaters, and Ron Weasley as keeper. Ron had only survived the tryouts with Hermione's help, who confounded his competition, Cormac McLaggen. In studying the Half-Blood Prince's book, Harry discovered numerous handwritten spells that the prince supposedly invented himself. Harry even considered the book to be almost a friend, a teacher, and sort of guide. Hermione disapproved of the book, partially because some of these spells have a dark nature, but mainly because it allows Harry to outperform her in potions. Three times, Slughorn attempts to invite Harry to one of his slug club parties, but Harry avoids them. 
In October, during a Hogsmeade visit, Katie Bell was nearly killed after being bewitched to carry a cursed necklace to Dumbledore. Remembering seeing the same necklace in Borgen's shop, Harry voices his suspicions of Malfoy to Professor McGonagall, but she, like Ron and Hermione, rubbishes his theory, stating that Malfoy did not go to Hogsmeade as he had a detention with her, and that there's no proof that he bought the necklace. Not long after that meeting, Quidditch season was upon them. In preparation for their first game, Harry replaced the injured Katie Bell with Dean Thomas. The team produced some results, both expected as the team excelled on the pitch and unexpected, as Harry found himself in a jealous rage after seeing Dean kissing Ginny after practice. The team's only problem was Ron, who was suffering from a lack of confidence. In an attempt to boost Ron's confidence, Harry blatantly acted as if he had spiked Ron's pumpkin juice with Felix Felicius. Ron took the bait and played a flawless match. However, Hermione took the bait as well and acted unkindly towards Ron and Harry. While she made up with Harry when he told her of the ruse, Ron's sudden relationship with Lavender Brown led to continued strife as it spiked jealousy in Hermione. While Harry attempted to reconcile his best friends, the Christmas holidays were fast approaching, and with them, the Slug Club Christmas Party, out of which Harry could not wriggle. Since the Chosen One rumors had been printed, Harry had received an unnatural amount of attention from the young ladies at Hogwarts, specifically a fourth year named Romilda Vane, whose attention bordered on obsession. As Harry could not ask Ginny to the party, he was left to ask Luna Lovegood to attend with him as a friend. At the party, Harry was surprised to learn that Hermione attended with Cormac McLaggen, a large Gryffindor seventh year who Ron despised. Hermione confessed that she did this solely on the fact that it would annoy Ron the most. He told her that it served her right when McLaggen was less than gentlemanly, only talking about himself in Quidditch. Later, after Malfoy was apprehended gatecrashing the party by Filch, Harry learned that Malfoy was indeed up to something. He also learned that Professor Snape had made the unbreakable vow with Narcissa in order to protect him. Harry's Christmas was less than enjoyable as he was cornered by the new Minister for Magic, Rufus Scrimger. He tried to persuade Harry to become the Ministry's mascot, an idea that Harry was not prepared to accept. During the meeting, Harry proceeded to tell Scrimger why he would not offer the Ministry his support, the main reasons being the Ministry's ineffectiveness in dealing with the Death Eater threat, the knowledge that Dolores Umbridge still held a position within the Ministry, the fact that the Ministry had proven throughout the previous year that it was incredibly corrupt and dangerously complacent to the point of being rotten, and the mere fact that Harry had no desire to be used. This discussion left Harry and Scrimger on increasingly bad terms. Upon returning to Hogwarts, Harry's sporadic lessons with Dumbledore continued. Early in January, Harry delved into a memory that all but proved that Riddle had murdered his own paternal family after his fifth year at Hogwarts. Then Dumbledore showed Harry a most curious memory, a memory that Professor Slughorn had apparently tampered with, and he gave Harry his first homework assignment, to get the real memory from Slughorn. After impressing Slughorn using a Bezoar in class, Harry tried the direct approach, only to be instantly shot down. By the 1st of March, Harry had still not acquired Slughorn's true memory, and had begun to grow more obsessed with Draco Malfoy. That morning, he awoke to found Ron under the influence of a very powerful love potion, and he took him to Slughorn, only for Ron to end up poisoned. Harry managed to act quickly and save him with a Bezoar. This was enough for Hermione to overcome her animosity towards Ron, and the three became friends again. In his lesson with the headmaster, Harry was upbraided by Dumbledore for not completing his assignment. Witness the young Tom Riddle murder Hepzibah Smith for the famous artifacts, Slytherin's locket and Hufflepuff's cup that she owned, and jinx the defense against the Dark Arts post at Hogwarts. However, Harry still could not figure out how to obtain the memory and focused on Malfoy. His interest was bordering on obsession. It was Ron who came up with the solution to Harry's dilemma with Slughorn. He suggested Felix Felicius, Liquid Luck. In the evening, Harry took the potion and not only managed to obtain the memory, but also solved many of his and his friends' problems including breaking up not only Ginny Weasley and Dean Thomas, but also Ron and his overly clingy girlfriend, Lavender Brown. Even though it was after midnight, Harry immediately went to Dumbledore with the new memory. It confirmed Dumbledore's theory that Lord Voldemort had created not one, but multiple dark magical objects called Horcruxes to ensure his immortality. Together, they theorized that the Dark Lord had created Horcruxes out of special objects such as Riddle's Diary and Slytherin's Locket. Before Harry left, Dumbledore promised to let Harry join him if he found another Horcrux. Meanwhile, a recovered Katie had returned to the school, causing Harry to ask her who gave her the necklace. She stated that somebody had imperiused her in the girls' bathroom at the Three Broomsticks. During the week before the final Quidditch match, Harry discovered Malfoy crying in the toilet and a duel ensued. With Malfoy on the verge of using an unforgivable curse, Harry cast Sectumsempra, a curse with unknown effects that he found in the Half-Blood Prince's book. The curse nearly killed Malfoy, earning Harry indefinite Saturday suspensions with Snape and a telling off from McGonagall. Unable to play in the final match, Harry awaited with anticipation as he sat through his first detention. When the detention was 
finally over, he arrived back at Gryffindor Tower and was happy to discover that the team had won the Quidditch Cup without him. Harry, having learned previously that Ginny and Dean had split up, and having come to terms with his own feelings, he was still unwilling to ask her out, fearing Ron's reaction. So, in the heat of the moment, he spontaneously kissed her while over 50 people watched. Thus marked the beginning of their relationship. On June 30th, Dumbledore led Harry out of the castle in search of a horcrux. Before they left, Dumbledore made Harry swear to obey any order given, regardless of his feelings about said order. From Hogsmeade, they apparated to a seaside cave where Tom Riddle had traumatized two young children from his orphanage in his youth. Once inside, he attempted to locate the Horcrux's second line of defense. He spoke in a whispered tongue and found a hidden doorway which only opened when it received an offering of blood. The cave was difficult to enter with a toll paid in blood and to get in the island in the center of the cave was only a small boat. During the crossing, Harry learned about another of the Horcrux's lines of defense. The lake was filled with Inferi, animated corpses of Voldemort's previous victims, which would attack anyone who touched the lake's water. Dumbledore instructed Harry on the use of fire as the weapon of choice against the Inferi, should it become necessary. The thought of the Inferi hidden below caused Harry unease, but he was quickly reassured by Dumbledore. Once on the island, Dumbledore found a stone basin from which he could not remove the Horcrux without drinking the Emerald Potion that the Horcrux resided in. Harry was reluctant that either one of them drink it as they did not know its effects, but there was no way to avoid it. Dumbledore extracted a promise from Harry that he would force him to drink, no matter how much he tried to persuade him not to. With this promise, Dumbledore drank and Harry watched as Dumbledore was driven out of his mind, but upheld his promise. Dumbledore drank and experienced intense stomach pains, dehydration, and saw visions that mentally tortured him. Harry managed to get the potion down Dumbledore's throat. When they finally finished the potion, Dumbledore fell unconscious. When he was revived by Harry, he asked for water. Harry attempted to conjure water for Dumbledore with a water making charm, but this proved ineffective as the water disappeared before Dumbledore could drink it, this being another defense designed by Voldemort. In desperation, Harry filled a cup with water from the lake, triggering the army of Inferi that were waiting below. As he splashed the water on Dumbledore's face, Harry felt something cold on his arm and saw a disgusting hand and the Inferi climbing up from the lake. Harry panicked and attempted to fight back with a multitude of spells and curses, including Impedimenta and Sectumsempra. None of the spells worked since the Inferi were too numerous and could not feel pain. He was overwhelmed and dragged under. Dumbledore, having regained consciousness, created a ring of fire around them that repelled the Inferi. He pocketed the locket and drove them back into the lake while he and Harry escaped in the boat. Harry then proceeded to apparate them back to Hogsmeade. After a short broomstick ride through the village, they landed atop the Astronomy Tower. Once on the tower, they discovered that Hogwarts had been invaded by Death Eaters. Dumbledore had stopped Harry from fighting and frozen him against a wall with a full body bind curse, hidden underneath his invisibility cloak, so all he could do was helplessly watch and wait. While waiting, Harry witnessed the death of Albus Dumbledore at the hands of Severus Snape. Dumbledore's body plummeted from the tallest tower at Hogwarts. With Dumbledore dead, Harry was free of the spell that petrified him. As the Death Eaters made their way out of Hogwarts Castle and onto the grounds, trying to reach the border where they'd be able to apparate again, Harry pursued and faced off against Snape. Harry tried many times to defeat Snape, even weakly attempting the Cruciatus Curse and Snape's own half-crafted spells, all with no effect. In the process, Snape identified himself as the Half-Blood Prince and escaped Hogwarts with Draco Malfoy and the other Death Eaters. Harry and Hagrid returned to the castle to find people staring at Dumbledore's crippled and lifeless body. Harry proceeded to stay next to Dumbledore's body, thinking that everything that had previously happened that night had all been for naught. Harry started crying over Dumbledore's corpse, as well as straightening his half-moon spectacles upon his crooked nose, and Harry wiped a trickle of blood from the dead headmaster's mouth with his sleeve. Harry, remembering the locket, took it from Dumbledore's robes. He was absolutely beside himself when he learned it was just a plain bit of jewelry. It was, in fact, just a decoy. There was a note inside the locket that revealed the real Horcrux was taken by someone called R.A.B. It appeared to Harry that Dumbledore had died in vain and that they had achieved nothing that night. Harry was still processing this information while Ginny escorted him to the hospital wing on McGonagall's orders, all the while holding his hand as means of comfort. Later, at the end of the year, Harry would inform Hermione and Ron of the decoy locket. Following the death of Albus Dumbledore, his funeral was carried out. Knowing he would have to hunt down Voldemort's horcruxes and fearing for her safety, Harry took Ginny aside and broke off their romance. Ginny told him that she did not care about the danger of being his girlfriend, but Harry still thought it was best if the two stopped seeing each other. He then spoke to Ron and Hermione, who committed to foregoing their final year at Hogwarts in order to accompany him despite his protests. Horcrux Hunt, 1997-1998 with four Horcruxes remaining, plus the unknown soul fragment residing inside of Harry, the trio made plans. Harry, Hermione, and Ron all remained committed to their goal to locate and destroy Voldemort's Horcruxes. 
Six out of 13 of Harry's escorts took Polyjuice Potion to take on Harry's appearance in orders to be diversions if they were attacked, despite Harry's protests. Upon leaving, the group was attacked by over 30 cloaked Death Eaters. Harry rode with Hagrid on his godfather Sirius's old motorbike that had been modified. They were attacked by multiple Death Eaters, and eventually Lord Voldemort himself, who had invented and mastered unsupported flight. Harry's owl Hedwig was hit by a stray killing curse a Death Eater had sent Harry's way. When Voldemort caught up with them, Harry thought this was the end, but his wand acted on its own and struck out at the man who was both kin and mortal enemy, destroying Voldemort's borrowed wand. The chaos ended when Harry and Hagrid passed the protective enchantments placed over the house of Nymphadora Tonks' parents, and Harry was still completely grief-stricken over the death of his beloved owl. After finding Hagrid safe and sound, the pair took a port key to the burrow, where he found a worried Molly and Ginny Weasley standing watch outside in the darkness. Harry was relieved to see that Hermione and Ron were fine, but was shocked when Remus Lupin arrived with George Weasley, who had lost an ear. Everyone else arrived safely, except for Alistair Moody, who had been murdered by Voldemort and Mundungus Fletcher, who had disapparated as soon as the fight started. Many amongst those gathered at the burrow believed that they had been betrayed, but Harry refused to believe any of those he loved would sell him out to Voldemort, much to the chagrin of Remus Lupin. Harry then stormed outside, where he was struck by a vision of Voldemort torturing Ollivander. Once settled in at the burrow, Harry, Ron, and Hermione helped prepare the wedding ceremony of Bill, Weasley, and Fleur de la Cour. At the party that night, Minister for Magic Rufus Scrimger arrived to release the contents of Albus Dumbledore's will. Harry was left the first snitch he ever caught in a Quidditch match and Godric Gryffindor's sword. Scrimger withheld this second gift, claiming that it was a historical magical item and was not exclusively Harry's property. Noting that Harry, Ron, and Hermione were the only students mentioned by name in the will, he asked the trio why this was, and they were unable to give him an answer. On the 1st of August, Harry attended Bill and Fleur's wedding disguised as a distant Weasley cousin, Barney Weasley. During the party, Harry met Luna Lovegood's father, Xenophilius. The reception was interrupted when the Patronus of Kingsley Shacklebolt arrived and announced the fall of the Ministry of Magic and the death of Rufus Scrimger. Chaos erupted and guests started to flee, while Harry and Hermione drew their wands and grabbed Ron before disapparating to Tottenham Court Road. There, Hermione revealed that she had planned ahead, packing supplies in her bag, which had an undetectable extension charm on it, and the three then entered a nearby cafe to hang low for a while. Whilst at the cafe, Ron and Hermione discussed the events of the wedding and Voldemort's coup. They unwittingly broke the taboo curse that had been placed on Voldemort's name when the Death Eaters overthrew the Ministry of Magic, alerting the Death Eaters Antonin Dolohov and Thorfinn Roll to their location. After a brief skirmish, the trio defeated the Death Eaters, whose memories Hermione wiped at Harry's suggestion. Harry, Ron, and Hermione then found refuge at 12 Grimald Place. Having found no leads regarding the Horcruxes over the summer, Harry discovered R.A.B. during the trio's first morning at 12 Grimald Place. Once Hermione remembered that the locket had been in the house during its occupation by the Order of the Phoenix, Harry summoned Creature, and they learned that it had been stolen by Mundungus Fletcher. When the trio questioned him about it, he revealed that it was now in the possession of Dolores Umbridge. Later, Harry and Hermione freed the Muggleborns who were being held by the Muggleborn Registration Commission, and Hermione conjured a copy of the locket while they took the real thing. They met up with Ron again and escaped, though Yaxley grabbed Hermione's arm while they were disapparating. She evaded him with a revulsion jinx, but the location of 12 Grimald Place was revealed to him, and they were forced to abandon it as a hideout, but instead Hermione took them to the woods that were the location of the Quidditch World Cup. After securing Slytherin's locket, the three friends took turns wearing it to ensure that it was not lost. The locket had a negative influence on all of them, straining relations and causing them all to act moody and inclined to get into petty arguments. They overheard a goblin saying that the sword protected by Snape was a fake. They learned that the sword of Gryffindor in Snape's office was a copy of the real sword, and that they would have to trace the location of the real one. Harry and Hermione were excited at knowing what object they could use to destroy Horcruxes, but the locket's negative energy pushed Ron over the edge. Knowing that they now had something they were not close to destroying, Ron and Harry got into a horrible row. Ron accused Harry of not knowing what he was doing and not being very concerned when they learned that Ginny Weasley had been punished for attempting to steal Gryffindor's sword for them, along with Neville Longbottom and Luna Lovegood. Ron then abandoned his friends, accusing Hermione of preferring Harry to himself. Ron's departure left both Harry and Hermione depressed. Once he left, Harry and Hermione left the camping site they were last in. Hermione tied her scarf on a tree for a reason, and with the locket in hand, they apparated away to Malham Cove. They set up the tent, and Harry stared into the sunset before dark. Hermione was listening to music, in which Harry noticed and came in. 
Hermione was even more depressed as her boyfriend left them. Harry offered Hermione a dance in which she took and they danced until the song ended and they were happy in that moment. That moment, Harry sat in his tent bed and watched his golden snitch and kissed it, revealing that it was made from flesh memory. He went to Hermione and told her this, to which she replied that she noticed the sign of the Deathly Hollows in her copy. They decided to head to Godric's Hollow as Harry wanted to visit his parents' graves and Hermione had convinced herself that Dumbledore might have entrusted the Sword of Gryffindor to Batilda Bagshot, a magical historian who lived there who had been friendly with the Potters and the Dumbledores. They arrived on Christmas Eve. After seeing the memorial dedicated to his parents and himself, Harry and Hermione searched the graveyard for the Potter's grave and came across the grave of Kendra and Ariana Dumbledore and that of Ignotus Peveril. Harry was filled with regret that Dumbledore had not shared this connection with him. Upon discovering Harry's parents' grave, Hermione called out to him and comforted Harry when he reached the grave. After placing a conjured wreath of flowers on his parents' graves, the two then met Batilda Bagshot, who motioned for them to follow her into her home. Believing Batilda wanted to give him Gryffindor's sword, Harry accompanied her upstairs alone when she indicated that Hermione should stay downstairs. Once there, she questioned Harry in what he did not realize was Parseltongue, revealing herself to in fact be Nagini, Voldemort's snake. Voldemort had murdered Batilda and animated her corpse to hide Nagini, who attacked Harry, biting and coiling herself around Harry. Hermione raced upstairs and repelled the snake while Harry's scar burned, alerting him to Voldemort's approach. In the scuffle, Harry's wand was accidentally broken by Hermione's blasting curse. After escaping Voldemort, Harry and Hermione camped out in the Forest of Dean. While they were camped out there, Harry and Hermione read parts of Rita Skeeter's biography of Dumbledore, The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore, which Hermione had stolen from the home of Batilda Bagshot. Upon reading, Harry felt betrayed because Dumbledore had not shared this information with him. Hermione tried to convince Harry that Dumbledore had his best interests at heart, but Harry became quite disillusioned. A couple nights later, while standing guard outside the tent, Harry was led by a silver doe Patronus to a frozen pool into which someone had place the Sword of Gryffindor, which leads Harry to strip into his underwear and jump into the pool. While trying to acquire the sword, the locket attempted to strangle him, but he was rescued by Ron, who had returned through use of his Deluminator. During the brief, intense skirmish, the Horcrux created disturbing imagery as a last line of defense. Ron was shown his deepest fears, such as spiders, and telling him that he was the least loved by his mother who craved a daughter. The final taunt was creating apparitions of Harry and Hermione, angering Ron, who then destroyed the Horcrux with the sword, casting the two away. As Ron had saved his life, Harry forgave him for leaving after seeing the Horcrux torture Ron, and explained that he had no feelings for Hermione beyond that of a sibling. Hermione, who had been inside the tent during the destruction of the Horcrux, was angry with Ron for a longer period. The three friends traveled to Luna Lovegood's home to question Xenophilius Lovegood. They asked about a triangular symbol Dumbledore had left them to decipher in the book he bequeathed to Hermione. After learning of the Deathly Hallows, Ron, Harry, and Hermione discovered that Xenophilius summoned Death Eaters in an attempt to persuade them to return his abducted daughter. The trio escaped the Death Eaters when Hermione blasts the floor open to show them Harry, but managed to keep Ron's alibi of being sick at home with Spattergroit intact by covering him with the Invisibility Cloak. After listening to a broadcast of Potter Watch around Easter 1998, Harry determined that Voldemort was seeking the Elder Wand and accidentally broke the taboo on Voldemort's name. Captured by a gang of Snatchers led by Fenrir Greyback, the trio were questioned about who they were. Hermione had previously hit Harry in the face with a stinging hex in an attempt to conceal their true identities, but it all amounted to nothing as the Snatchers then found the Sword of Gryffindor. After Greyback and Scabior realized that they had caught Harry Potter, the trio were taken to Malfoy Manor in Wiltshire. The Snatchers decided to forego taking Harry to the Ministry, but instead to Voldemort directly. When Bellatrix Lestrange learned that Harry had been caught, she immediately sought to summon Voldemort. She planned to do this until she noticed one of the Snatchers had the Sword of Gryffindor, which was supposed to be in her vault at Gringotts. From her drastic change in tone of voice and her worries that they would all perish, Harry determined that another Horcrux was hidden there as well. Bellatrix isolated Hermione for interrogation based on the knowledge that she was muggle-born, stating that she wished to talk girl to girl with her, and proceeded to brutally torture her with the Cruciatus Curse. As Hermione screamed in pain upstairs and Ron sobbed at hearing her, Harry called out for help, a cry heard by Aberforth Dumbledore through a fragment of a two-way mirror in the cellar. Aberforth sent Dobby the house elf to rescue the prisoners. Harry had him take Luna Lovegood, Garrick Ollivander, and Dean Thomas to Shell Cottage while he and Ron went to rescue Hermione. On the way, they had to fight Peter Pettigrew, whose silver hand strangled him to death when he hesitated to kill Harry, who reminded him that he once saved his life. 
a skirmish ensued upstairs, during which Harry took Draco Malfoy's wand from him, and Ron saved Hermione and Griphook with Dobby's assistance. As they escaped Malfoy Manor by apparition, Bellatrix Lestrange threw a silver dagger to where they were disapparating. Harry was initially relieved to realize that he managed to apparate to Shell Cottage with Ron, Hermione, and Dobby in tow, but was horrified to see the knife protruding from the elf's chest. Harry managed to lie him on the grass, where Dobby collapsed and died in Harry's arms, with his last words being Harry's name. Harry decided that he would not dig Dobby's grave with magic, opting instead to do so manually using a shovel. This was his way of both repaying Dobby's bravery and ebbing his own grief, as his time, effort, and sweat went into the grave. During the funeral, Luna Lovegood gave a short eulogy to Dobby, and Harry managed to say his final goodbye to one of his most loyal friends. Following the death of Dobby, Harry, Ron, and Hermione stayed at Shell Cottage for some time. During their stay, the trio formed a plan to break into the Lestrange vault to obtain the Horcrux within, with the help of Griphook. Due to the fact that Griphook would only help in exchange for Godric Gryffindor's sword, Harry decided to word his request that the handover would not take place until after Harry had used it to dispose of the remaining Horcruxes. Harry also found out information regarding the Elder Wand from Ollivander. He learned that his hunch that the Elder Wand was real and that Voldemort was going abroad to search for it was correct. Harry also learned some complex wand lore, such as what happens when a wand's allegiance changes to that of another individual, and that a wand's allegiance doesn't necessarily have to change hands through murder, as most, including Voldemort, believed with regards to the Elder Wand. Although feeling guilty for the deception, Harry knew that the sword was their only known weapon against the Horcruxes. The trio and Griphook left Shell Cottage early on the morning of May 1st to break into Gringotts. Hermione disguised herself as notorious Death Eater Bellatrix Lestrange using Polyjuice Potion. The goal was to try and fool the goblins at Gringotts into believing that it really was Bellatrix who was entering the vault. The trio had Bellatrix's wand that Harry had captured at Malfoy Manor as further proof for the disguise. Ron was transfigured to look like a foreign wizard named Dragomir Despard, and Harry had Griphook on his shoulders, both under the invisibility cloak. Their plan went reasonably well. Inside, the goblins requested Bellatrix's identification. When Hermione hesitated, one nervous said that her wand was sufficient proof, though Hermione claimed it was new. Harry suspected the goblins knew that Bellatrix's wand was stolen and were looking for an imposter. Griphook told Harry to use the Imperious Curse. He complied, and Bogrod then accepted the wand as being correct. Bogrod requested the Clankers, and then led the trio, Griphook and Travers, into a passageway. After many twists and turns, the cart passed through Thieves' Downfall, a security waterfall that washed away all illusion charms. When the cart overturned and dumped them out, Hermione and Ron had been reverted to themselves. Griphook believed the other goblins knew they were imposters, but Harry wanted to continue and cursed Bogrod again. The trio and Griphook found the vault guarded by an aged, half-blind dragon. Griphook subdued it using the clankers. Hearing pursuit approaching, Harry forced Bogrod to open the vault, which was filled with precious objects. Hermione screamed in pain, and they discovered that the vault's protective charms included flagrante and gemino curses. The contents would multiply and become searing hot every time something was touched. Harry spotted Hufflepuff's cup, the Horcrux, but it was out of reach. Hermione levitated Harry by the ankle, and he snagged the cup by using Gryffindor's sword as to not be burned by the metal. As Harry was setting himself down, he dropped both the sword and the cup. Griphook grabbed the sword and flipped Hufflepuff's cup into the air. Harry caught it, ignoring the searing heat. Borne by a treasure avalanche spilling from the now-opened vault, Griphook ran off with the sword, yelling that thieves were in the vault. Harry, Hermione, and Rong hurled curses at the goblin throng. Harry released the half-blind dragon, and the three jumped on its back. The freed dragon took flight, and the three blasted holes into the ceiling for it to fly through as they made their escape. A vision from Voldemort helped Harry realize that the third Horcrux, whilst unbeknownst to him at the time, Ravenclaw's diadem, remained at Hogwarts. Harry, Ron, and Hermione set out on their final mission to return to the school and obtain the diadem, inadvertently tripping the caterwauling charm upon apparating to Hogsmeade, and thereby alerting the waiting Death Eaters to their presence. As Death Eaters began to close in on the still invisible trio, Aberforth Dumbledore emerged from the Hogshead, hurriedly telling the three to enter his pub. After Aberforth re-entered his pub and home, he scolded them for coming to Hogsmeade, advising them to leave the country. After Harry engaged in a brief and fierce argument with him, he led the grateful trio directly to Hogwarts through a secret entrance behind the portrait of his deceased sister, Ariana Dumbledore. Neville Longbottom, acting as their escort, then guided them to the Room of Requirement, where they were enthusiastically greeted by the reconstituted Dumbledore's army, most of which had been beaten and bruised, yet ready to fight the Death Eaters controlling the school. Harry tried to tell them that he, Ron, and Hermione only returned to find something, but Neville contacted other allies 
allies with a call to arms. Harry hesitantly asked the room at large if they had ever heard of any sort of legendary artifact belonging to one of the founders of Hogwarts. Luna Lovegood then elaborated on the fabled diadem of Ravenclaw, pronouncing that a statue in Ravenclaw Tower depicted Rowena Ravenclaw wearing a diadem. Harry, having no idea of what the diadem looked like, was led by Luna to the Ravenclaw common room to observe the statue. All students of age, the DA, and the members of the Order of the Phoenix who had arrived to fight prepared themselves for the impending siege. The Battle of Hogwarts began as Voldemort and his army approached the outer boundaries of the school. On May 2nd, Lord Voldemort, upon arrival at Hogwarts, demanded that the school turn over Harry. After thinking on it for some seconds, he went to the Grey Lady to ask about the diadem. From her information, Harry surmised that the Horcrux had been hidden in the Room of Requirement. Harry, in the meantime, was worried about Hermione and Ron, who seemed to have disappeared. They had gone into the Chamber of Secrets where Hermione destroyed Helga Hufflepuff's cup using Basilisk Fangs, which were one of the few weapons able to destroy Horcruxes. The trio quickly headed for the Room of Requirement where Harry remembered seeing the diadem the previous year. However, Draco Malfoy, Vincent Crabbe, and Gregory Goyle ambushed them. After a skirmish, the entire room was destroyed by the cursed fire Crabbe unleashed but could not control. Harry managed to fly himself and Malfoy out while Ron and Hermione grabbed Goyle, but Crabbe perished in the flames that also destroyed the diadem. With one Horcrux remaining, Harry, Ron, and Hermione continued their pursuit of Nagini. Once the trio arrived at the Shrieking Shack, they witnessed Voldemort order Nagini to kill Snape, as he believed that Snape was preventing him from being the true owner of the Elder Wand. Dumbledore was the previous owner of the wand, and as Snape killed him, Voldemort believes with Snape's demise, he will finally gain true mastery of the wand. Before he died, Snape gave Harry memories to view in the pensive and asked him to look into his eyes. Upon returning to the castle, Harry saw the corpses of Remus Lupin and Nymphadora Tonks near Fred's and he felt devastated. He left his friends behind to use Albus Dumbledore's pensive, welcoming the time in another's head to distract him from what was happening in his own. During a one-hour ceasefire, Harry viewed the memories given by a dying Snape, which revealed to him that he had inadvertently been turned into a Horcrux himself. This occurred when Voldemort attempted to murder him as a baby. Because Lily Potter's loving sacrifice made Voldemort's killing curse rebound, and a fragment of his soul latched onto the only living thing it could find, this was Harry himself. This led to the awful truth being revealed, that Voldemort had to kill him in order to be rendered mortal. Harry was unwillingly tethering Voldemort to life. Harry also learned that Snape was all along with Dumbledore because he loved Lily Evans since before they started school. It was clear that Harry's lifespan had always been determined by how long it took to get rid of the Horcruxes and it was an elegant plan not to waste any more lives but to give tasks to the boy who had already been marked for death and whose death would not be tragic but simply another blow against Voldemort. Heavy of heart, Harry courageously slipped off on his own to carry out this dreadful task. Harry then entered the Forbidden Forest where he managed to open the Golden Snitch which said on it, I open at the close, and the words to open it were, I'm about to die. This revealed the resurrection stone contained within. Harry used it to speak to the spirits of his parents, Sirius Black and Remus Lupin, who gave him comfort and courage before he met Voldemort and offered to shield him from the Dementors. They set off, and the Dementors' chill did not overcome him. His companions acted like Patronuses, and Harry continued deeper into the forest to find Voldemort. As Harry approached the Death Eater camp, he dropped the Resurrection Stone. Harry offered no resistance as Voldemort struck him with the Killing Curse. His last thoughts were of Ginny, before everything went black. However, the death he met was not permanent. The blood Voldemort had taken from Harry to restore his physical form in 1995 still contained the Bond of Blood, anchoring him to life and protecting Harry from Voldemort's curse. Also, since he had part of Voldemort's soul in him, Voldemort's killing curse unknowingly destroyed the part of Voldemort's soul, leaving one Horcrux left. Harry entered a state of limbo where he met the spirit of Albus Dumbledore and the piece of Voldemort's soul that had just been destroyed. Dumbledore explained everything to Harry, saying that he had no more secrets from Harry. After reconciling with his mentor, Harry made the choice to return to the physical world. Harry woke up but feigned death. He was assisted in this by Narcissa Malfoy, who had secretly turned against Dumbledore by telling him Harry was dead in order to protect her son, because she knew that the only way that she'd be permitted to enter Hogwarts was with the rest of the Death Eaters on their victory march. Voldemort then triumphantly disgraced Harry's dead body with the Cruciatus Curse, then forced Hagrid to carry Harry's body back to Hogwarts, proclaiming Harry dead and demanding surrender. At first, the surviving 
Great Fighters were heartbroken, especially Ron, Hermione, Ginny, and Professor McGonagall. They screamed abuse at the Death Eaters in anger, remaining defiant. Harry's apparent death had spurred the defenders of Hogwarts on. Neville Longbottom courageously stood up to Voldemort, and when the latter offered Neville a rank in his Death Eater society, Neville proudly refused and screamed to the high heavens, Dumbledore's army. And Neville was able to pull off the sorting hat, and from its depths, he received the sword of Gryffindor and sliced off Nagini's head in one swift motion. Unbeknownst to Voldemort, mastery of the Elder Wand, which he had stolen from Dumbledore's grave, had not been taken from Dumbledore by Snape, but by Draco Malfoy, because Draco had disarmed Dumbledore on the night of his murder before Snape killed him. Thus, when Harry had disarmed Malfoy in Malfoy Manor weeks earlier, he had become the true master of the Elder Wand. When Harry and Voldemort faced off for the last time, Harry tried to tell him this and about the other mistakes he had made. Harry also asked him to feel some remorse for his actions, which Voldemort instantly rejected. Voldemort cast the Killing Curse, and Harry countered with the Disarming Charm. The Elder Wand refused to attack its master, and the Killing Curse rebounded, destroying Voldemort once and for all. Immediately, Harry was surrounded by overjoyed fellow fighters. Hermione and Ron reached him first, and then Ginny, Neville, and Luna. Victory celebrations began, and Harry was an indispensable part of the grief and celebration. Harry decided to prevent the Deathly Hallows from ever being reunited again by keeping the Cloak of Invisibility, leaving the Resurrection Stone where it lay in the Forbidden Forest, and returning the Elder Wand to Dumbledore's grave, but not before using it to fix his wand. After Hogwarts Harry ensured that Severus Snape's portrait was hung in the headmaster's office at Hogwarts. He also made occasional visits to the school to give lectures to the students on defense against the dark arts. Harry was also on Christmas card terms with his cousin Dudley Dursley and his family, and occasionally visited him. Harry also made peace with his former rival Draco Malfoy, something that his father and friends were never able to do with Severus Snape. Career as an Auror, 2007-2019 at the end of the Second Wizarding War, Harry was recruited by the new Minister for Magic, Kingsley Shacklebolt, and became an Auror at the British Ministry of Magic. In 2007, Harry became the head of the Auror office at the age of 26 or 27. Harry had married Ginny likely sometime before 2005, but certainly by 2014. By 2017, the couple had three children of their own, two sons, James Sirius and Albus Severus, and one daughter, Lily Luna. Rising Tensions on September 1st, 2017, Harry and Ginny took their three children to King's Cross Station to see James and Albus off to Hogwarts. There, they met Ron and Hermione and their two children, Harry's niece Rose and nephew Hugo. When Albus expressed a fear that he might be sorted into Slytherin House, Harry told his son that Albus was named after two Hogwarts headmasters, one of whom was a Slytherin and probably the bravest man he ever knew. Harry assured him that his parents would be proud of him regardless of where he was sorted. He also told him that the sorting hat would take his preferences into consideration, which which happened to him when he was being sorted. This was a secret he had never shared with his other children. When Harry picked Albus up from King's Cross, who had returned from a year at Hogwarts, he was surprised to find Albus distant and cold. This distance was in direct response to the pressure Albus felt regarding Harry's legacy and the expectations that others put on him because of it. Albus and Scorpius Malfoy became fast friends during the year as they were kindred spirits. Both carry a burden stemming from their family identity and feel that they are misfits and losers in compared with the other students at Hogwarts. Harry did not like this and said he questioned why Albus was content to only have one friend. Their relationship would stay strained for the next couple years to come. In September of 2018, Harry took Albus to King's Cross again. He was hurt when Albus told him he wanted to be alone. This stemmed from all the pedestrians watching the two. Albus felt as though they were watching the famous Harry Potter and his disappointing son. Harry told him not to be bothered by people looking and thought his friendship with Scorpius Malfoy, the child of his rival, was the reason why Albus wanted nothing to do with him. Harry then demanded Albus sever their friendship, but his son refused. Fused. In September 2019, Harry took Albus to King's Cross yet again where he gave Albus the permission slip he needed to visit Hogsmeade. Albus destroyed the slip by burning it, stating that he had no wish to go to Hogsmeade and left his father behind. This, in turn, caused Harry to become angry with him. Their father-son relationship continued to deteriorate, going from bad to worse. Head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement 2020 to present. By late summer of 2020, Harry had been made head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. After hearing a rumor about an illegal and very powerful time turner, Harry and his team of Aurors raided the Knot residence and confiscated it. Harry defeated Knot in a duel and then arrested him. He was arrested for the illegal possession of an unregistered and advanced time turner. Knot had created at least two time turners for Lucius Malfoy, who was paying him for his services. This prototype, which was restricted by a boundary of five minutes, was seized by Potter and later used by his own son to travel to the past. 
The improved Time Turner, which gleamed gold and allowed the Traveler to stay in the past for an unlimited time, was kept by Lucius, who never used it. Harry turned the prototype Time Turner over to Hermione, the Minister of Magic, for safekeeping. While in his paper-laden work office, he and Hermione spoke about recent activity following Voldemort's former allies and how action must be taken. They discussed the mountain trolls riding grab horns through Hungary, giants with winged tattoos on their backs walking through the Great Seas, and the werewolves that have gone entirely underground. Harry was later visited at home by Amos Diggory, who had heard that he might have the Time Turner. Whom he supposed learned this information from is unknown. While Albus and Delphi Diggory, who claimed to be Amos's carer and niece, listened in, Amos demanded Harry go back in time and save Cedric. Amos proceeded to tell Harry that Cedric was more than a spare, and that he deserved a chance to live a full life. However, Harry refused due to the implications of intervening greatly with the past, as changing the past can have a severe consequence on the future. This caused Amos to react negatively, calling Harry cold. Later that night, Harry attempted to reconcile with Albus. Harry's relationship with Albus had strained increasingly since he had left for Hogwarts. In an effort to mend things, Harry spoke to Albus and tried to give him the old baby blanket he received from his mother Lily. He did this in the hope a reminder of what happened would make him change his behavior. This was a significant and sentimental gift on Harry's part, as it was the only physical piece of his mother that he had. When Albus rejected the gift, it led to an argument in which they both expressed the wish that they were not related. Harry regretted what he said, but it was too late to take it back. Harry began to experience nightmares and pains in his scar, something that he had not experienced since the final defeat of Voldemort. Ginny tried to comfort him and proceeded to ask what was wrong. When Harry explained, they decided to let Hermione know. Harry took his scar hurting to be an ominous sign, and it left him with many worries concerning his son and the outcome of the future. He and Hermione held a public meeting, but the community was not convinced there was a threat, as they were not willing to accept that danger was once again imminent. Draco accused Harry of only wanting his name in the papers, and proceeded to storm out of the public meeting. Later on, Harry, Ginny, and Draco then learned that Albus and Scorpius were missing. This prompted Draco to start a duel with Harry. Ginny was quick to interrupt it before it got out of hand. They had decided to retrieve the Time Turner and help Amos save Cedric. Ginny concluded Albus ran away after his argument with Harry, and Draco was upset that Scorpius had been pulled into their family issues. Albus and Scorpius's time-traveling antics created two separate alternate timelines. This was something that could have disastrous effects for everyone. In one, Harry received a dream revealing Albus's location in the Forbidden Forest. As he and the others searched, Harry came across the centaur Bane. Bane warned him that a dark cloud haunted Albus. He took this dark cloud to mean Scorpius, and his doubts regarding his son's friendship with him strengthened even more. He, Ron, and Ginny found the boys just after they returned from the past. Scorpius was uninjured, but Albus sustained a broken arm. Albus was brought to the school's hospital wing, where Harry conversed with a portrait of Albus Dumbledore. After Harry aired decades of pent-up emotion left over from the horrors of his childhood, and Dumbledore reassuring him that he did what he thought was best for Harry's well-being at the time, the portrait advised him to see Albus as he is. Harry demanded that Albus break off his association with Scorpius. He even went so far as to bully headmistress Minerva McGonagall into using the Marauder's map to keep them apart. This was something that he would not normally do. Harry's worry for his son had intensified so much that it blinded him to the bigger picture. When Albus and Scorpius went time traveling again, Harry and Ginny received a visit from Draco. He and Harry argued about their children, which resulted in a premature wizard's duel. When Ginny intervened and reminded them that their children were missing, Draco surprised them by explaining how lonely he was at Hogwarts and how lucky Harry was to have such great friendships. Harry and Draco finally gained a mutual respect for one another and looked upon each other as friends. When Draco speaks of the great bond and sacrifices that he has made for Scorpius and his late wife, Harry finally realized he was dangerously isolating Albus. They returned to Hogwarts where Harry apologized to Professor McGonagall and they attempted to locate the boys, ultimately discovering that they had the Time Turner. However, in the other timeline, Albus and Scorpius had created a world where Harry died at the Battle of Hogwarts. Fortunately, with the help of the alternate Hermione, Ron, and Severus Snape, Scorpius managed to salvage the original timeline and returned both Harry and Albus to life. Harry visited Albus in his dormitory, where despite his anger, he manages to plant the seed for a reconciliation. Later, Harry and his friends learned that Albus and Scorpius were missing again and were last seen with Delphi. They went to see Amos to find out what he knows and found out that he had been confounded by Delphi into believing that she was his niece and carer. Searching the room for clues to find out Delphi's true identity, they stumbled upon a prophecy that, if fulfilled, would enable the return of Voldemort, and realized that Delphi's true identity was Voldemort's secret daughter with Bellatrix Lestrange. However, since they did not know where in time Delphi, Albus, and Scorpius were, they could only bide their time and wait. At home, Harry looked at the blanket he tried to give Albus. He noticed writing on it and found out it was a message sent by Albus from the 
the past. He and Ginny notice the date being 30th of October 1981, one day before the night that Voldemort murdered Harry's parents. They alerted Ron and Hermione. Draco, who joined in, secretly revealed to them that his family had a time turner that would be more potent and valuable than the one seized by the Ministry, which was merely a prototype and thus not as desirable to a true Death Eater. They traveled back in time to join Albus and Scorpius. However, under Ginny's prodding, they realized that Delphi did not want to kill baby Harry, but rather stop Voldemort from doing so in the hope that he would live and his reign would continue. Delphi thought that she could make her father stronger, as he would know love when he met her, which it's lacking was what originally led to his downfall. Everyone agreed they had to transfigure Harry to look like Voldemort in the hopes that they could fool Delphi and hinder her in saving the real Voldemort. They picked Harry because he not only knew Voldemort well enough through the connection they shared while he was a Horcrux, but he also understood Parseltongue again. Delphi pleaded with her father to recognize her, which Harry managed before the transfiguration spell came undone. However, when Delphi sees that she's been set up, she engaged in a fierce duel with Harry, who was later joined by his friends and Albus. They managed to subdue her, and she pleaded that she only wanted to know her father. A surprised Harry explained that this would not be possible. They cannot change the past. Upon hearing the real Voldemort arrive to kill Harry's parents, Delphi tried calling out to him, but Hermione and Malfoy silenced her and sent her back to present day. Harry decided to watch the scene of his parents' murder once more, with Albus by his side to provide a sense of closure for them. They later returned to the present, while a devastated Hagrid arrived at the scene to bring Harry to the Dursleys. Back at Hogwarts, Albus was asked by Harry to join him one afternoon for a hike up a steep hill. Harry revealed that he had brought Albus to Cedric Diggory's grave, which he regularly visited so he could apologize for his role in his death. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.